Hello and welcome to the very fourth ever episode of the latest show on the Stat Check Network. It is episode four of Take All Comers, the calm before the cascade. I'm your host, Tyler Bortel, joined by my illustrious co-hosts, uh, Nicholas Olson Johnson. And the other one, it's Mucus Drooler. Close enough. And today we are joined by Do a I very special ampersand? guest. Do I like the at? <laughs> Absolutely. Today we're joined by a very, very special guest. Um, are you in Bellingham? Bellingham zone? I don't know. I don't know what city in Washington you're in technically. Washington zone. I, I'm on the Canadian border. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Who the hell are you? Oh. Oh. He instantly crash. <laughs> 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 well, joining us today in theory is a man with some shocking Wi-Fi issues for a technical professional. It's our boy Noah Bedome coming in. Oh, is he here? He's back? I don't know. Maybe he's here. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for joining us, Noah. Uh, I'm now sitting directly all... under the router, so it better work this time. <laughs> Fantastic. Today's episode is all about the upcoming event hosted by this man, attended by these small children. Um, I'm bad at pointing. <laughs> And that is the Cascade Clash 2024, the inaugural major put on by Aegis Games in Mount Vernon, Washington. But before we jump into any of that and our discussion of it, I got to check in with the boys. How are we doing today, Lucas? I'm doing great. Uh, it's been a busy week, but very productive and fun. Um, we're just kicking off a couple fun scrimmages with Team USA. So I played uh, one of those this morning, got another one coming up on Monday. So the team is busy. Um, we're all busy, but, you know, fun stuff all bound. And uh, exploring new factions as well, like I, we were talking about last week, um, kind of diving headfirst into Death Guard, trying to figure that all out, um, mostly from a team's perspective. But it's kind of fun. There's a lot of new novel stuff, but I'm enjoying I'm enjoying all of it. Um, yeah. Not a whole lot on Orthodox to report. How about you, Nick? How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm finally feeling like I'm getting over this freaking cold, dude. Uh, came back with a vengeance last week. So, yeah. Um, been enjoying this. Looking forward to this weekend. I uh, got some painting to do in preparation for Cascade Clash. And I'm excited to be playing some more Hammer. I got my own scrim tomorrow morning. So that should be sweet. And then... You know, we got our major next weekend. So, yeah. Going to be some Warhammer-filled weekends. going to be sweet. How about you, Tyler? How are you doing this morning? I am doing super well. Uh, in a shockingly similar position to the rest of y'all, I believe I have finally defeated uh, the great Ligma that has infected my body for the last week and a half. Finally feeling a little bit better. Um, but still, you know, a little bit of that. So we'll see. But yeah, a lot of painting to do for uh, for Ages Open next week when we talk about lists, or not Ages Open, Cascade Clash next week. As we talk about lists, I'll talk about just how many Necron Warriors I need to paint. Um, but it's gonna, we're having a good time. Um, similarly, really excited about uh, the uh, the scrim. I just played my scrim game in Ireland yesterday and uh, took down Double Andrea to Redeemer with the Endless Swarm, which I thought was going to be a bad matchup. But it turns out WTC Terrain is an entirely different ballgame. Uh, also ooh, feeling real great after we had uh, our second ever teams night this past Wednesday, um, featuring the uh, the Rose City Ruffians, the what are they, the Bridge City B team? Is that what the other team's called? Yeah, we got Rose City Ruffians, Bridge City B team, All Six Society. I think that was the people in attendance. Yeah. Anyway, got all of our our, our, our local group together and did a quick eight v eight scrim. Um, of my uh, a team that I was running versus a team that Lucas was running. Lucas ended up picking up the uh, high end of the draw on that at team run, but I beat him when we uh, we paired into each other. Um, so you know who really won? We'll find out later. It was a really good time. Big shout out to everyone who participated in that. Um, we're gonna definitely gonna keep that going. Last Wednesday of the month, it's uh, Team Forty K is the best way to play Forty K. Um, so very excited to get more of that going. But that Team 40K is uh, narrowly edging out uh, the second best way to play 40K, which is is at your local super major uh, without any GW who, uh, assistance necessary. Um, so before we jump into that, though, I'd love to check in real quick. Noah, how are you doing this week? What's going on in your world? I imagine things are a little bit busy uh, this time of year. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for being on. I love you guys, so I'll always be here. But um, life is pretty insane. 
Um, if you set aside the work and the three children and uh, my own prep for um, playing as a Merc on Team Mexico this year for WTC, I am also, like you said, putting on a super major. So let's go. That's super hype. Yeah, I know there's a bunch of teams joining the WTC scene this year, and I think Mexico is one of them, right? This is their first year going to Yeah, Belgium. it's their first year. They're really stoked, and they're super cool guys. Um, their team captain actually already secured his golden ticket in, like, the opening event for the Mexico season. So, like, I'm pretty stoked to be playing with those guys. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. I know there's other teams joining as well. I think South Africa's first year was last year. There's a couple countries from Asia that are now going. I know there's a team Southeast Asia that's coming for the first time this year, so that's pretty cool. cool. Um, so yeah, it's it's cool to get some people that are not from the you know Western world to come and be a part of our game. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm really stoked about it. It's going to be super fun. Um, and then I've been painting a ton of terrain, um, prepping stuff, testing some missions, doing you know just making sure like the missions for Cascade were selected with balance in mind. And then there's just like some sanity checking of like, hey, we're going to play through these and just make sure that I didn't widely misunderstand something. Um, and then I've got my own super major to go to. Shout out to Dan Miner and Wet Coast uh, in Canada. I'll be going to Wet Coast to try to take get my own golden ticket. Um, there's one for best overall in first place. So I'll be probably taking the um, stinky Chaos Knights boys up there. Very the cool. Better knights, you mean? <laughs> the better, yeah. The the knights that have the one stratagem that makes knights work. Yes, exactly that. <laughs> yeah, turns out. Terror shades, man. Best strat in the game. Um, Long leash, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, if you, I, I really wish you could long leash on Serastus Knights. It makes me so mad that you can't. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No keywords. Yeah, sweet. Well, let's jump right into the main topic uh, today a, uh, and your segment on it, Noah, which is, of course, the Cascade Clash coming up next week. Um, could you give people the quick, uh, you know, the quick 101 from the, from the top down on what is this, this event? What's the story behind it? What's got you running an event like this? Um, you know what, what 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 should people be expecting thing out of this if they're if they're following and might not be in attendance? Yeah, so uh, Cascade Clash was born out of two major things. The first was um, when some unpleasant circumstances happened to our old local game store, uh, Dark Tower. Uh, it was closing; it was going to cease to exist, and a bunch of us were part of that team, and that was our community hub, right? So we banded together and we bought the store. We always knew that the store was basically just always going to break even. Um, we have the store at a pretty stable point, but one of the ideas we had is we saw a vacuum and we thought, hey, we could create a really good event. Uh, we've had some, we built some pretty goodwill, build a really good event. And that event could also be a springboard for us to do some reinvestment in the store, uh, work on like expanding the space, adding new stuff, whatever, because it's a nice, you know, shot in the arm if it's successful, right? That was one. And the other one was all of us who are running this are people who go to, who fly to major tournaments and those kind of things. And there's like a laundry list of gripes. I think we all have that you basically have at like every single event you go to. Right. And it, you'll have some bingo card of those gripes, right? Um, no breaks between rounds, no food on site. Um, things didn't fire on time. Missions were terrible, just whatever it is. Right. And so obviously no event is going to be perfect and every geo does their best, but we tried to create the event that like we would want to go to. Right. So the idea was um, if you look at like the schedule, like we structured it out so we could feel like everyone could have enough time to actually feel like they were moving comfortably through and things would fire on time and all that stuff. Um, I'm fat. So I made sure we had tacos. Um, we selected missions that were balanced and then we we will talk about it more, but uh, we put a huge, effort into like the table setups and those kind of things. Goal making an event that like, uh, it's kind of corny to say, but a competitive event by competitive people, but also like we want to be open for anyone, hobby, sportsmanship, all this stuff, like everyone's welcome, but we wanted it to be built so that competitive players would feel very comfortable competing there and have a good experience doing so. And there's more than just Warhammer going on. There's like, 
uh, six different Magic tournaments, Malifaux, War Machine, Lord of the Rings, um, and a couple other things going on. And then there's a brand new game in the Northwest called Manifold that's also uh, past its Kickstarter, and it's having its one of its first premier events on site there as well. That's really exciting. I mean, yeah, I've, I was always kind of yeah. under the impression that this is like a, it's almost like a convention type of thing, right? Where it's like, it's it's Brian. like 80% tournament, 20% convention, because it's a bunch of different groups of people getting together. It's not just a 40k event, although that is kind of like the main show, theoretically. Are, is there also magic going on? <laughs> there is. There's, um, on Friday, we have an RCQ for um, getting onto the, you know, qualifiers for Pro Tour stuff. On um, Saturday and Sunday, we have um, a competitive commander tournament called CEDH, and it's got the largest current prize pool that's done been done in um, the Northwest ever for CEDH. There'll be a bigger one later this year that's going to, but for now, we're going to have the thing. We're giving away a, a first place is going to get a $3,500 um, 30th anniversary Black Lotus in addition to a bunch of cash prizes. So that's a two-day super competitive magic event. And then there's also um, a Team Trios event going on, Can Lander. And then there's also one of the larger events for Malifaux is going on this um, this weekend as well. Nice. Fantastic. Well, we're all super excited to uh, to, to jump into to this event. It's going to be a really good time. Um, and we've got a couple of questions here for you from some of our listeners who uh, I wanted to lead with those because I want to make sure that we have time to, to check in with everything. Sure. Um, one, of the, yeah. Uh, one, and uh, where was it? I want, this was the place I wanted to start. Uh, yeah. Uh, Noah, oh, it's at, not Noah. You're Noah. Uh, Sam is asking Noah um, about uh, some of the terrain and stuff that y'all have been up to. I know you've been spamming a couple of different chats that's with uh, trying to yeah, figure yeah. out an entirely different approach um, to terrain than some of the other events that we've been uh, covering on the show here. What are you guys doing terrain-wise? Is um, Are we playing? Please tell me we're playing fixed layouts, and is it, is it going to be pretty? What's going on? Yeah, so it is fixed layouts. It's G-Dub fixed layouts with um, acrylic templates, right? So that's the thing. Um, we considered doing the, I forgot what they're called, the new like variation of GW layouts that are, people are using. Um, but we decided to stick sp strictly to the GW layouts for this event. Um, and one thing about terrain, right? So most of the TOs who run these events have a whole bunch of logistics considerations they have to put into place about transporting the terrain, storing the terrain, et cetera. We have a kind of a situation where we're in a pretty good spot as far as those logistics. And the event is actually right, right next door to my the house I grew up in where my parents still live. So we have a staging zone for like a lot of stuff, which means we decided to do something different with the terrain. A lot of times people are investing in like the like the MDF terrain or like the, you know, like the collapsible modular stuff. We actually like mo majority of our terrain, some of it will be a couple borrowed sets. That we're going to make sure are correctly configured with the right pieces to be optimal. But we actually, we working with Donald Plummer designed and printed. Well, we we took some initial sets, we modified them, changed them. Donald changed them in um, 3D modeling, and then we printed these balanced, hopefully, sets out with two things in mind: one, like GDA balance, but also aesthetic. We wanted people to come to the table be able to play on a high quality set of terrain that had a theme, was attractive and felt immersive so they could have the full experience of both competing, but also feeling like immersed in the game, which I think is one of the things that 40K is really amazing for. So what we did was with that terrain, each one of the artists on Team Aegis took some number of them home and with no guidance, basically got to try something new out on almost every piece of terrain. So majority, there are a couple like where one guy sat down and did like six sets, but a lot of the terrain are unique bespoke paint jobs for each set. And you'll have multiple sets that are the same physical set with entirely different feels. One might be like aquatic, one might look more nurgly, one might look more like um, like it came out of Skyrim. I painted one that was like a salamander bunker where everything is melting on fire. So that was, I mean... And while that might not mean a lot to competitive players, like purely competitive players, 
if you know Team Aegis were hobby and competitive were kind of equally meshed for us. And part of that emergence is really important. Yeah, that is super exciting to hear. Um, you know, as much as we we all bash on um, FLG events, I think one of the things their terrain does really well is like it. A lot of the sets, anyway, not all of them feel really cohesive. Is like the Necron table, which is like terrible to play on competitively, but it looks <laughs> yeah, cool because it feels like you're on a tomb world. The Orc uh, Village, right? Like it probably isn't the best competitively balanced, but it looks really damn cool. It feels like you're in an Orc shanty town. So I'm excited for a little bit of that. It's it's not something that I felt in a long time because um, a lot of the terrain, like you know, obviously from a competitive standpoint, you prize functionality over over aesthetics. But like to have both in the same time is uh, is going to be pretty cool. I'm very excited. Yeah, Donald did an amazing job. Um, all the guys doing painting did an amazing job. We're really stoked about the terrain. It, none of it collapses down neatly though, so every one of it is like a large box. So it's going to be a lot of work to to transport and set up, but we're we think it's worth it. Fantastic. Well, I can't wait to see it. I'm very excited. Uh, we'll make sure to get lots of pictures uh, at the event to uh, to throw oh, in the post games to see just how cool all of that stuff looks. As far as how big of a project this is, I don't think we've really mentioned how many tables are you bringing to this event? Like, what's wh what's what's the scale of uh, of Cascade this year? So right now, before I jumped on here after drops, we had about 116 people. We're going to fire with 116, but not you know allowing for additional signups or drops um ages itself went from zero like you know maybe like really we had like eight kind of tables but we went from zero of these new tables to um 50 <laughs> starting in august to now and then we're probably going to borrow uh, we're, we are borrowing about 10 tables that we're going to kind of mix and match some of the terrain sets to make sure that we emphasize balance and then a set of cohesion for you know a couple of the filler tables. We wanted to be able to do them all, but it is logistically complicated to print and paint that much terrain. And getting to 50 tables is, was a lot of work. Um, we Our max is currently set at 150. And I don't think we're going to tap out, but I think I wouldn't be surprised if we got to 130. Fantastic. So if people are still are hearing about this time for the first time right now, tickets are still available. They can still sign up. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. And if, if someone, while it's not, I guess, if it is frowned on, even if you want to sign up after the list lock, we'll let you sign up because we want everyone to play. But, um, you know, it, it's kind of hard to like, you can't really like sniper a list into a 130 person event, right? Because like, oh, I designed for this matchup. Okay, well, I got none of that matchup and I died. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Sweet. Um, uh, kind of, kind of along those, those same lines, I think you did a really good, uh, point of emphasis on this with the terrain, but I'm sure there's a lot else going on in the event as a whole. Uh, Derek asks, how do you identify things that you can do to increase enjoyment of your event for different types of attendees? Uh, I use there's something to enjoy for the more there to have games players versus something for the more competitive players. And I know that was a lot of words, so I'm going to pull it up on screen. Um, yeah, <laughs> I love this question. Because it's kind mm -hmm. of like the heart of like why we did it. So like people, some of the people on the Aegis team, part of the design for the event are more hobby. Some of us are more competitive play. Um, but we all, the sportsmanship, the hobby, the lore, the competitive play are all super important to all of us. Um, and so there's a couple of things, right? So for instance, Kazra Husadar is our head paint judge. He's also going to be floor judging with us, but he is a amazing renowned painter who does a bunch of commissions and is just fantastic. Won a bunch of best painted at huge events. Um, he and I designed a rubric that's supposed to make sure that if you put the effort in for a hobby, it'll be recognized and the person who wins hobby will have the best painted thing in the room, no doubt, but also transparency. So like as we score the hobby, those are going up in a spreadsheet. It's going to be world viewable and linked. So everyone can go see where their standings are. That's a common complaint about people when they compete in a hobby. Um, another is the aesthetic of the terrain and the balance of the terrain, right? Um, and then another is the missions. So honestly, like that whole thing of like making sure that everyone had something, immersive visuals, a good hobby track, balanced competitive play, um, time to chill and talk. We have a 15 minute buffer between every round before pairings go live. So you have like time to like reset, 
do your thing, chill out with your friends, relax, right? Um, and we even have a dinner break in the schedule because we have a taco truck coming on site. So people can just like take some breaths. So really it's supposed to be le a little less intense. Things aren't like chained together. So the more casual players have a little more breathing room. And the more competitive players have like, since they're kind of used to operating the time, have actually some downtime while everything still moves quickly through the schedule. So like this, this is my favorite question. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. Um... I'm very excited to to see how this all works in practice. Uh, it's uh, it's very easy easy to to read eat a schedule. It's another thing entirely to design one. Um, so we'll 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 see how that checks out. I'm, I'm excited. I think it's one of those things that like doesn't seem like that big of a deal when you look at it, but when you think about the implications, like there there there's probably a lot there. So I'm I'm excited to to see what that feels like. Um, one of uh, one of your or. Uh, uh, self-proclaimed locals uh, his name is tommy and he asks um as someone in the local area i've enjoyed the balanced culture between hobbying and competitive warhammer that i found at ages can you talk a little about your journey as the owner of an lgs uh, as well as how you've gotten that culture to grow in your store yeah um when i got into 40k like the i got into 40k like 15 years ago for a little bit then got out but when i got into 40k for this stint um I got in because my wife was like, hey, you're working super hard, and then your downtime is spent on computers or or mobile games, which you can do anytime, which means it fills up all your space. You're kind of like not present right now and stressed out. You need to figure out something that isn't a computer or a screen that can get you like, you know, away from that so you can chill out. And I was like, all right. So I was looking for something. And I my brother had had a chaos army that got ran over by a car, and it was literally in pieces. So like, look, pieces. So I spent like three or four months um, and a space wolf army as well. I spent three or four months um, for the space wolf army was less bad, putting it together and repainting it. And then for the chaos army, actually like hand sculpting, like Nurgle rot, where all the pieces were so decimated that they didn't actually fit together anymore. Um, and then I had these two fully painted armies. It was like, well, I should go play them. And then I went into the store that is now Aegis and got shellacked by like double move double shoot yanari old school eighth edition insanity and that beating was so sound that i was like oh i want to play competitive and then i went and started playing competitively and i made these relationships with these amazing people um and the hobby all the people that i like made relationships with like lee and jt were hobby first people and what's cool is I got to learn from them and they like sat and taught me and worked with me. But then also I was more competitively minded for the competitive play and I helped them. So we like, it was a very like mutually supporting growth relationship. And I think because it was kind of mutually thinking about like the things that were important to each of us became the thing that is important to all of us. That's just what the team was built on is like hobby and playing your very best game, even if you don't win the event doing your very best and a growth mindset. And then like be, people wanting to invite us back, like wanting to build relationships because that's where we got a lot of our social interaction because a lot of us are dads or people with busy lives. And then when we bought the store, it was kind of like, oh, we want the store to be this. So our store is, is a very competitive focused store. We have a lot of CEDH, so competitive commander. We have um, some of the better competitive players in the Malifaux scene. We have a bunch of amazing competitive players, Sean Hopkins from War Machine, um, a bunch of, across a bunch of different systems. But the vibe is always super chill because the goal is community first, build good relationships, have a growth mindset, but still maybe kick ass along the way. And that's been like, that's kind of fundamental. And it's true in our business practices too. There's a bunch of amazing game stores that are um, around us here in Bellingham. Uh, our previous, the previous owner of Dark Tower was hyper competitive to the point of being adversarial with those people. When we started out, we took about the beer, we sat down and just told them, look, um, there is no competition. We're gonna do our best and we just want the store to break even and do well. We want everyone else to be successful, plug your events on our Discord, work together, but we aren't doing any of the compete stuff, the market share is wide enough. And that mentality has stuck with us and is present in our gaming. And I think that's why you have a little more of like, no one is gonna um, hurt somebody else just to win a game up here, right? 
Sorry, a little long-winded, but I care deeply about it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's worth caring about. Um <clears throat> Uh, I, uh, as son of a, a seemed like kind of a, a natural follow up to me, uh, Derek Urquidal also asked how that sort of translates then. And uh, this, like, on a store level, we're trying to navigate conflict by being as open and broad and letting, letting, letting making it as acceptable, as acceptable, as accessible a space um, for everyone and as, uh, as possible and not feeling the need to compete with other stores. How do you feel like that translates down to the more individual level? Um, how do you, what do you handle, handle conflict between things like attendees? Is how do you, um, how do you manage that as a person in, in a position of authority here? Um, not just talking to other stores who are at that same kind of level. Yeah. Um, so like a lot of that stuff is stuff I do in my, like personal corporate life too. And then obviously I have kids. So like uh, de-escalating and dealing with conflict is pretty normal in my day to day. Um, I think the the fundamental like core concept is that at the end of the day, people are usually upset because they don't feel heard. They care deeply about something and they don't feel like that's being acknowledged given the correct amount of respect. Um, they just don't feel like they have an equality in the conversation. That's usually what results in a significant amount of conflict. Now, the other way is when someone is being, uh, someone is actively hurting somebody else's feelings. And a lot of the time, it's more often that's because of um, accidental negligence, not um, intentional harm, right? I would say the very small number of people are being willfully hurtful on purpose, just like, the most of the mistakes that happen at a game table, the very small percentage of them are intentional cheating, right? Um, and I think so coming into a conflict, whether it's with somebody who I'm all across the table with or somebody who I'm, um, you know, coming into like mediate a situation, the first step for me is always to make sure the person understands that we're both humans and that I'm committed to understanding and hearing what they need, even if I'm not going to give it to them. Um, you know, I've had, I think twice in my 40K career, someone like get like actually physically threaten me at the table. Um, and yeah, it actually happened at World Champs. Um, I, uh, I, that's, not, that's quite an ambitious thing to do. You're not a small man. Like, no, 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 no. I'm 330 pounds for a Marine, whatever. Yeah. I mean, good on him, right? Uh, but he was, I like, he, it was like, it was a classic, like, Chaos Knights charge where they put something out of charge range, but then put a screen between the two. And there was less than four inches of distance between the screen and the target. So you hit it, you wipe them out with the tank shock, you pile it, and you tear something in half. This was a squad of Mandrakes and a Raider or a Ravager. So, I completed. He goes, you said I couldn't be charged. You know, for lying, people get punched in the face for that. And I was like, oh, <laughs> all right. So the first thing I did was like, hey, man, I'm not going to play when they're like this. I understand you're frustrated. You can explain the situation. I'm going to go use the restroom. Like, I'll get a judge and we'll chill out. And he was real heated. I walked away, came back. The judge came back, put a hand on his shoulder, talked to him. We had a heart to heart. He shook it off. And we had a great game. Right. And I think it's just usually people aren't mean just to be mean or they're not upset just to be upset. They're upset because they misunderstood something or they feel like something was happening that was wrong. And I think just getting to that core and everyone treating each other like a human is important. Most of the time when someone else is mad, you immediately like meet them on their level. Like, no, screw you. Right. And that's like the exact opposite thing that you have to do. As long as you do that, usually things work out. Well put, man. Yeah, ab absolutely. We, um, this is at the end of the day, a, a, a social contract, contract hobby and uh, being, being ready and able to enforce that at whatever level, whether you're the person involved or now is you're the person who's going to be called in to yeah, bring down the elbow on uh, some, some unfortunate souls who uh, decide to make a mess out of nothing. I, uh, I'm real glad that we uh, put it in our one in charge at the event. Mm hmm. In Discord, um, we're putting all our judge rulings that happen on the floor that are not just like a clarification of the rules, but like something where mm -hmm. an interpretation or judgment call has to be made. 
Um, totally. And in those, those are all in a channel and a judge calls. And in the, one of those specifically a clarification that says, hey, if you are willingly cheating or willingly being hurtful to someone, you are leaving. Like, it's over. <laughs> Goodbye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that... Um... I know that there's been a lot of discussion in the community recently around uh, Frontline Gaming putting out an actual policy where they claim that people's actions might have consequences in the future. Um, and I'm very glad that it took you uh, less than a decade um, to get to that point. So congratulations on, uh, on well, beating I mean, them to the punch. <laughs> I was on the receiving end of that. Like I almost didn't get my golden ticket because mm -hmm. of cheating at LSO. Yeah. Right. So like it, it lives in my heart, man. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. Fantastic. Awesome. And then the last question we have from the listeners here is actually from Curie um, from the main show on Stat Check. Uh, he asks, Noah, how do you handle being so damn sexy and being good at the game and being a brilliant hobbyist? Um, uh, well, I start by being really bad at taking a compliment. That's where I start. It's like the foundation for my approach. <laughs> um, I actually, so like I, I was talking to my wife about this and um, I think for me, it's just that like, I don't think of myself as any of those things. I mean, I'm, I'm very attractive. I understand that. But the other ones, you know, I, don't think uh, I think I always have taken an approach, like not in a deprecating way, but always thinking of it that like, there's so many people who are just outstanding masters that are better than me at, you know, all the aspects, whatever, that the goal is just to like improve. And I think part of that is I'm always in pursuit of happiness, not gratification. I think a lot of the time people go to events or do a thing with the intent of winning because that winning provides them gratification, dopamine for doing it. For me, I just want to like enjoy the process of whatever it is. And I think some of the lack of like stress and tension around it just give me more license to like try shit that I normally wouldn't try or whatever, or be more okay in a, like, I don't really get flustered when I'm losing because whatever, it's fine. Um, that's like the best I can answer that question while receiving a compliment because it feels very alien. But yeah, I mean, also I think <laughs> so. If you, to take it in a to pick up on something you said a while ago, um, that kind of is along the same uh, same coming from a similar sort of place. Like you're not a you're not a guy who is ever not busy. It seems like you've got a whole lot going on. You've got the full family. You've got the very intensive job. You're running a store, and you're also trying to travel to events. What advice do you have to anyone who's feeling a little bit overwhelmed by trying to do all of that at once? How do you do you find balance and achieve in all of these things, or at least most of them at once, uh, without everything coming crumbling down in some you know house of cards situation? Like it seems I, I have significantly fewer responsibilities than you do, and like I feel like it's a bit much to play at this level, and like. I'm a single dude in his twenties who lives with that guy. Like we're chilling. Um, how do you do it all, man? For sure. Um, I mean the, it's like priorities and communication, right? Because like the, I couldn't do it if I somehow like had all these responses and didn't have an amazingly supportive partner. I couldn't pull it off. Um, but I also have some like privilege in the terms of that, like, being at the state I am in my career, I can kind of just say, hey, I'm going to take these days off. Um, I've built up enough reputation that like, if I say something's going to get handled, even if I'm taking a large amount of time off, it, it gets trusted and it works out. So I will say that like a lot of time, effort and like 12 years of, you know, career stuff got me to a point where I have a little more wiggle room than most people at in my career field. So that's like, a, I want to make sure I, I, I acknowledge my privilege. Um, but the other part is that, like, I think for me, I understand that I have some base requirements and I have an idea of one, what the actual priorities are. For instance, 40K is not more important than the welfare of my children or the welfare of my marriage. Right. So I have to make sure those things are taken care of. But if those things are taken care of, then on that list is my own personal welfare. And what I need for my own personal welfare is mental stimulation. And I need community and those kind of things. So it's like a 40K is one of my priorities, right? So, and it's because of the people community, the relaxation I get from painting and the mental stimulation I get from play. I am just like a better, healthier human and a better partner and dad 
when I play 40K. Now it does cause some logistical complications. So I have some like some ground rules. I never miss a holiday for 40K, regardless of how small the holiday is. So Valentine's Day, um, uh, uh, Easter, Gotta be day, Arbor day. never miss a birthday. Yeah, yeah. So I never miss, well, Arbor Day, I don't care. But you know what I mean, all the other ones. <laughs> but I never miss a holiday. I never miss uh, a birthday. Um, and I, uh, I kind of preset that I'm going to do six or seven majors in a year and that's it. Um, and I never do back to back events. So I never do an event. Um, I never do two weekends in a row because I will get murdered. And then I almost always make sure I do something super fun with my family. And then the last bit is like, I think it's weird how it's influenced my hobby. I do a lot of the artist opus style moist brushing, like dry brush style. Uh, I do a lot of my armies in that style, not because it's my favorite style. It, I mean, you like it. But the reason I don't airbrush as much and the reason I try to get good at not airbrushing is so that I can paint while watching movies with my family. Because I can't airbrush while I'm watching a movie with my family. So I can knock out 2,000 points of stuff in a, while still being a good dad because I'm sitting there paying attention to the movie because I'm an ADHD kid and I'm dry brushing the crap out of this army and I'm like, uh, and I try to integrate my family in it. Like when I finish models, I leave them on the corner of the kitchen island for the morning when the girls get up before I do. And I almost always wake up to my girls like ooing and aahing at the hobby progress I've made. So I guess, I mean, I know that's like long winded, but I think it's just like you, you have to integrate it into what you're doing and you can't have a mill. Like I have one hobby. I, I don't play video games. I, I hang out with my family or I play 40 K and that's it. Right. So like, or work. So you have to prioritize those things. If you make 40 K a priority and don't make it a priority at the expense of the like humans you have to take care of, it works out, but you have to like literally be like, Oh, I'm not doing that. Sorry. I'm not going to go watch that movie with my friends because I, instead I'm going to reserve that time for 40 K. So all my friends play 40 k Funny how that works out. No, I, I really like the, the point you made about, um, I really like the point you, I think you did. Uh, I, I like the point you made about um, involving the other people in your life. That is something that I did as well. Um, growing up in a house where my parents are both graphic designers and my dad also does miniatures painting um, oh, or cool. did when he was, uh, you know, younger, like in his 20s and 30s. So, you know, every time, every night when it was time for dinner, it would be, you know, show up early to help set the table and then spend the last three minutes bringing full up all the miniatures I painted the afternoon after school for my dad to look at, um, which would be really cool. So, yeah, dude. yeah inv involving the family is like is really fun. And uh, like your significant other or something as well. Like it's it's always amazing when they um, support your your hobby needs. Yeah, the partner help is, is if you have a partner, the partner being bought in, if the partner actively hates your hobby, you, I mean, I know I'm not saying to like, don't like change who you are for your whatever, but like if your partner is really upset by and the hobby is causing issues with your partner, you probably need to pause the hobby and figure out the situation with your partner first. When your partner is supportive of the things you're doing, everything is so much better. Yes. Yeah, ab Absolutely. Fantastic. I have a question um, for y'all. Oh, please. So I tried. I listened to your guys' uh, podcast about raiding the Leviathan mission packet. You guys walked through all the deployments, you walked through all of the missions and all the stuff, and you raided it. And I literally built my missions based on that data point and some other data points leaning towards what y'all said and what other people have said is the most is balanced. And my question is, how do you feel about the missions that are presented for Cascade Clash? Does anyone want to go first? Cause I'd be happy to go. Let first. me, let me start by bringing up the missions so I can, yeah, I can, do that. I, I have them up here. Let me, and let if me this is off script, then that's a problem. Let me know. No, Not no, 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 this is going to be great. 
I think that I think that Lucas has been waiting for an opportunity to talk about these, uh, and now I'm get opened uh, up to some so. criticism. To me, right I've been so. unfortunately I've been so busy I don't even know what these are. I mean, I like took a look oh, so I know them, but I I don't have them committed to memory yet. <laughs> All right, okay. well, so uh, so day here's day one. Be on layout. One and they're three. They're going to be on layouts one or three. Yeah, the, the mm -hmm. whole table will be set up basically 50. The whole hall will be set up 50-50. By the way, I really like this way of setting up tables. It removes all that stupid, like, inter-round, moving the terrain around and, like, that, that hectic bullshit. So, nice. Yeah. That's certainly something that's possible, like, smaller events when you have, like, three TOs and only, like, maybe like 15, 16 tables, but for an event this size, definitely, I mean, takes a lot of that craziness out of lunch for you guys. Yeah. It's a smart idea. Yeah, especially when... Shout like, out to when, Dan when Miner. He also hook, hooked us up with widgets. Oh, the sorry, widgets are what's up. That that was always the secret sauce of the GW Open events. You'd see either, ju either judge go up to change the table and like, look left, look right, whip out his widget, measure everything real quick, and then stuff it back in his pants because he's uh no one's supposed to know the actual measurements of where everything's supposed to go. That was an interesting <laughs> way to phrase that. Let's not do that again. But, uh, but yeah, yeah so good, good on you. <laughs> yeah. I got, I got a widget for that. Um, but yeah, I think that that particularly doesn't work well um, at the GW scale even um, because these layouts are pretty specific. Like we we had this happen at uh, at Gongai where we were using layout was it layout three but like everything was off because we we're using the NTL versions of the maps not the GW ones and like everyone yeah. complained that the, the layout was terrible and, and then like, we talked to... getting shot like crazy what's going on yeah because everything was just a like... little bit more spread out yeah. yeah so having having the consistent layouts and having stuff pre measured with widgets that's a great call very excited to to get to play on that so. Um, let's go. Let's let's go round um, um, by round. We got round one. I think it's pretty straightforward. Take and hold, chilling rain, search and destroy. Like, yeah, it's a good round one mission. Eases people into the into the event. It's very very neutral. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think, Lucas? Good good stuff. Yeah, I approve. Fair enough. All right, cool. And then round two, we're immediately taking a hard left from regular boring normal into ritual scrambler field sweeping engagement. <laughs> uh, yeah, like we were mentioning during, uh, so the the podcast Noah was mentioning is um, on the old Best in Tabletop Network. It uh, I forget which episode it was. I think it was like maybe three or four weeks before we switched over to Statchex. So it was probably if you want to go back and watch us sometime in like December or maybe late um, November. Um, it was a, a review of the Leviathan mission packet, and we talked about all the deployments, all the secondary missions all of the primaries and kind of put them in a, a classic tier list. Ritual was one that we said was a little bit unorthodox, um, but we would have loved to see it more at events. So I'm glad it's here. I think it's a fun mission when played on the right deployment. And I think sweeping engagement is the right one for it just because no man's land is so wide uh, and there's so much to do in no man's land that I feel like uh, this is the, this is the correct one to play it on. Uh, if you play it on something like camera and anvil, you're just trolling. So um, I'm excited for this one. I think Scrambler Fields is a little wacky and weird. Um, I'm not necessarily opposed to it. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm excited for this mission, honestly. I wanted the, for that, I wanted some fun missions. I don't, I hate the events that just have chilling rain on everything. I understand that it reduces some issues. I want some funner missions, but I didn't want, but I wanted to stay like in the realm of reasonable and not like servo skulls. <laughs> so, I like Scrambler Fields because it at least if someone has a dedicated plan, like my army is the Deep Strike army, it makes them have to think a little bit differently. And then for armies that maybe would have a bad matchup into the Deep Strike army, it gives them one extra tool to play with to maybe level it out, right? For those armies that like, I don't know how GSC is doing now, but the armies that use GSC used to just annihilate, right? It was mm -hmm. at least gave them like a shot. Yeah, for sure. Also, like, deep striking that... is really powerful right now. Like, the best armies in the game, not every Super. single one of them, but the vast majority of them are just, like, pick up, put down armies, deep strike at three armies, reserve, blast you off the table armies, like, ner toning that back down in a very reasonable way. It's, like, not nerfing that damage, but instead saying you can't show up in X or Y place. That was kind of cool. Vanguard and Necrons? Vanguard, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think that 
uh, I'm with Lucas that sweeping engagement is definitely the right deployment setup for this because, yeah, playing this on hammer gets very silly very quickly when you can just build a freaking wall of impenetrable objective markers. Um, I think that it's good to put it early. I like it being round two. If this were round five, I'd be a little up in arms um, because it's definitely one of the most impactful missions. And to be like, oh man, I made it to the semifinals. Whew, let's go. Oh, I get immediately shut out by while playing against one of the best players here on mission that is that just yeah. ruins my army. Bummer. But in round two, hopefully you're not paired into something especially crazy. You might be, but it's better uh, odds round two than it is round five. Um, and I think that, yeah, that, that, that's my, that's my main thought here. I know Nick, you we actually got a chance to, to play a, this mission yeah. to test it out. I think recently. this what, is going to be it? the most controversial choice here because the ritual is seen as one of those aha goofy missions, which it is. It's, I think the mission's pretty cool. Like the idea behind it, like the spawning, the objectives and like the tempo between that. I think it's one of those missions that it's just kind of difficult to play at the table um, because you're not like a lot of people use those neoprene like circles for their objective markers. Right. And when you spawn objectives, you can't really do that because you're spawning them under a unit. So you either have to pick up a bunch of models, which like now the position has been changed to put a disc under them, then put them back, which is not really that feasible. Like once the game really gets going, so you have to use a little chips. And then even then, now you're trying to measure like with three inch sticks from that chip and you're like, okay, behind the wall, am I in range of that? Like yada, yada. It's just like a lot of bookkeeping, which really slows the game down. And I'm happy that's why it's round two. If it was round three at the end of the day, I guarantee you people would make tons of mistakes on this mission from being tired. Um, another thing too that Tyler said, like if it's like later on in the tournament, um, cause what is it? Especially with like deep strike armies, right? remembering scrambler fields on this that's just another thing it's like okay not only do i have to like keep measuring three inches from this like token to see if i'm in range of the objective to like hold it i now have to measure it to make sure i'm not cheating by accidentally like redeploying onto it or you striking onto it um so it's just like a lot of a lot of bookkeeping and i know that you guys have like this super fantastic terrain that you've printed but i'm assuming it's all like adhered to the base no it's like you can nope. pick it up from the, the plates yeah so it's all of the the only terrain that has a base are the tiny little, like there's like a couple of really small ones that have like some outcroppings or whatever, yeah. kind of like those G-dub um, rubble piles that go on. Everything else okay. is just on top of a clear acrylic. So that's good. Cause I've seen some people do like ritual when they have like their plates stuck to the, you know, terrain on top. And it's like, that's like pretty much impossible to put the mission on because now you're trying to measure a three inch stick where there's a wall in the way. So you guys are kind of just kind of just making up where yeah. the is and ends. So that's really the only <laughs> annoying thing about this mission. Um, definitely sweeping engagement was the right choice for it. Hammer and anvil, just not the way to play ritual. Um, so yeah, no. um, I'm glad it's early on in the mission back. Like Tyler said, it would really, really suck to get to like the finals of the event. And you're like, oh, this mission hard counters my army. Like, and this is a tough, like this is a matchup where like we maybe tie. One of us wins by a few points, but this is like, you know, the straw that breaks the camel's back. Like. So. Yeah, I remembered what I wanted to say earlier, which is that I'm also really glad that if you're going to put this mission in your pack, that this was published ages ago. Yes, right? people should. What I heard. absolutely find abhorrent is when and we get the oh, I'll just tell you the missions when the round starts, and the missions are are on the wackier end of the spectrum. You can like, say bird. You can say Jason Bird by name. It's okay. We all know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when he comes up and claps you on the back, and he's like, "This is gonna be a hard army for you." Oh, guys, we're room. playing hot dog, hard fucking, yeah. you know, <laughs> taking hold hot dog. Okay, what the hell is hot dog? You boomer. Oh anyway, God, I love you, Jason. Um, but this is how to do a mission back, my guy. Yeah, you He'll put it out. There, so when you get matched up against him, when you get matched up at him, you can be like, "This is for hot dog." <laughs> yeah, but like, get him with the grilled uh, cheese, agree, dude. <laughs> agreeing with Tyler here, like. What's nice about this yeah. is seeing it early. Like, I specifically practiced this mission. One, because I mm -hmm. haven't played the ritual in ages, because most tournaments don't play it. And I'm like, I need mm -hmm. to refresh myself on how this mission works. Because I guarantee yeah. you, a ton of people are not going to actually play the mission correctly. Like, um, yeah, because it's so weird. Um, people always get like the measurement stuff wrong. Um, people sometimes accidentally put the chip in their DZ, and now they can't score any points from it. Um, <laughs> another thing too. It, it also changed. recently changed. Yeah, go for yeah. it. Um, so objective control used to check end of any phase, 
Um, and I think it what was it at the end oh, of the Oh yeah, cleanse got buffed. Yeah, so how it used to exactly. work was like there there wasn't a phase after you spawned it. Like you'd spawn it and then the, the turn would end and it would go to your opponent's turn. So you couldn't like do secure no man's land on spawn objectives. You couldn't like extend battle lines on spawn objectives. You couldn't cleanse spawn mm -hmm. objectives. If it was the end of the game and you spawn an objective, you didn't get primary for it. And they changed it recently to objective control also checks end of player turns as well as end of phases. So now it's like the ritual is a very playable mission. Yeah, I think I think it definitely it but definitely helps a really lot. So like, look out for that. Mm -hmm. Please. One thing I really like about the ritual last note is like um I like that there's a play style choice too, in terms of like when you go up against an army, you can choose to spawn your own objectives and create kind of your own like chosen ground. But you can also just go take your opponent's objectives. The last time I played on this mission, I didn't spawn any. I let my opponent spawn all of them and I just went and took them all. <laughs> and I never, I, they, they, they committed aggressively into my deployment zone thinking I was going to spawn objectives. And I just basically like Knights of Shade passed them, went and took their objectives and then killed them off of everything else and just never spawned an objective all game. And I think having those different modes in a mission makes it fun. Holy shit. For that's sure. a fucking based strat. I need to try that. <laughs> yeah, it's hilarious. You think I'm going to spawn objectives? Yeah, we're going to trade No, I, I, th I thank you for spawning of my objectives. I appreciate that. I'm going to salt the earth and go take yeah. your home now. I don't mind. You can have mine. Trade Z's. Go for it, dude. Hilarious. Well, I'm and if you swirl, them. then they're in this weird position where they now get to like spawn objectives on your side of the board. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh yeah, yeah. It does get goofy. Yeah. Very cool. cool. All right. So we'll see how this goes. I'm sure that next in two weeks we'll come back on and say that this was the worst decision anyone's ever made. Uh, but until then, it seems like a great idea right now. Um, and we're gonna say that because we're gonna Nick and I are gonna play a mirror match on this. It's gonna be super fun. Um, all right, round three. I'm. <laughs> it's time for the worst mission of all time. It's round three. It's purge the foe. Chilling Rain Crucible uh, Battle. Of of all time. You see, the trick in this mission is just always go second, and then it doesn't suck because it's super unbalanced about going first. But yeah, the the purge the foe, the reason that I understand that there's an unbalance for um the going first, but the reason um I put this as I wanted to put it somewhere, but I wanted to put it. It's a pretty simple mission in terms of like, oh, yeah. like kill things, hold things. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel like you can offset the go first advantage if you just like don't hang it out there. <laughs> if you go first, if you can like practice some discretion. <laughs> but I don't think 40k players are good at discretion. Yeah, I, I think there's some interesting decision making, right? Because I mean, there's always the chance that your cards tell you to area denial or extend battle lines turn one and it's like well am i really going to give up kill one hold one or am i going to give up the free five points like that is an annoying decision to have to make but like you, you kind of have to think about that thing those things a little bit more um and i think we all agree right like if if kill more wasn't a thing on turn one not only would people score a little bit less insane primary on this mission which it tends to be one of the higher scoring ones um or more like swingy like one person scores 16 the other person scores 50 and it's just stupid um mm -hmm. So I, obviously if that was removed on turn one, I feel like we'd all think it was a better mission. But like, I think if people give it a little more thought and like try to actually weigh up the options instead of just defaulting to the me draw, extend battle lines, me go forward. Well, your opponent getting eight points is better than, sorry, is worse than than you getting five, right? So like, just give a little, put a little thought into it. And I think you can, you can have more fun on this mission. Yeah, agreed. Against uh, Donald Plummer, I played at Sladeshmas the last round. We tied... And the reason we tied is um, turn one, I put uh, I put a dude out there to do my secondaries. He killed him. He got his points. But if we did the math, I won by two if I just didn't go do my secondary. Mm -hmm. so, it's it's a good yeah. it's a decent mission to have in the mission pack because it's certainly like you're talking about ritual scrambler fields is there for like hey all these deep strike armies pay attention in this mission. Purge the foe is definitely there for like, hey, all these armies that rely on like little trash units. Think about the trade-off. Is it worth using that trash unit to get those three secondary points? But it gives your opponent these kill points. So yeah. 
Yeah. It's a mission that I see like yeah, all the time. I'm, You're gonna play it all the time. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna be entirely honest. I looked at this mission pack and uh the last part of my brain that was like, dude, you should play Swarm. Swarm is great, just died. It's like no. Yeah. Just not gonna do it. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to play purge round three. <laughs> I'll play if you put purge in round one or maybe round two, I'll consider it. But like, I'm not playing purge round three. But again, um, another great reason why to like release the mission pack early because like seeing exactly. that for certain armies, you're like, I'm just not gonna play that army or I'm gonna vastly change some of the stuff in my list so I don't drop this round. Absolutely. All right, brings us over to day two. Let's talk about mission O, oh, Lucas's which is Lucas's favorite mission. Yeah. What's your favorite mission, Lucas? Vital ground, crucible of battle. Two crucibles in a row, the best deployment type. Let's go. So, glad this is round four, not later on. I feel like one of the dumber things is like when a swing your mission like this, where, where primary is hard to come by, is like later on in the event. Um, then, like, your finals or semifinals game can be like, are you playing a pressure army or are you not? Especially if you're like playing a pressure army into a more defensive army and you play on vital ground, it's like, oh, nice, free win. Um, so this is this is going to be a nice like you know certain armies do have advantages but at the end of the day it's it's not the end of the world if you uh um if you play this in round four also seeing layout one and four here interesting so the blunt the thunderdome is going to be always present through the event mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. uh i think so because that's how the that's like how the mission selection kind of synced up i could go double check but i believe that's just where we're going to have to be at uh there were some compromises that had to be made on um day layouts and mission based on like what was there otherwise i could have selected some of the missions that i thought were worse and had some other layouts but that's fair enough i mean i'm not a fan of that but that's mostly just because of the army that i play so that's totally reasonable um yeah i mean uh, me too i mean i feel you I do not like the Thunderdome, but that's mostly just because uh, my army does not like it. I don't Steve know what you're talking about. Thunderdome was great. Like I have the, no complaints. Yeah. <laughs> He's ready. Yeah, so the stand wherever you I want to like army this does not care about the, be... the terrain. Nice. I'm going to go double check because I feel like I meant it to be 2-4 and day one to be 1-3. Don't, so don't, do don't do layout two. Don't do layout two. <laughs> okay. That's the crappy one. <laughs> All right, well, we'll keep it like it is then. It's Fine. Okay. Oh, that's why I didn't do it. You're right. That's why I didn't do it. I was like, someone, I think, it wasn't Tyler, I think it was Anthony, was like, don't do that one. <laughs> Layout yeah. 2 is the one that works for Dawn of War only and does not work for Dawn of War. Yeah. You notice that there is a little It gives you a little list. building to hide over in the corner, not near any God objectives. Bless. Dawn of War is a terrible deployment type. You, yeah. Would you trade having Thunderdome in the room every day, even though you don't have to play on it, to not have Dawn of War in the room any day? <laughs> Yes. Would I tr give? Would I take Dawn of War to get rid of the Thunderdome? Yeah, probably. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Really? Dawn of War? Yeah. The Thunderdome is super cringe. Really? You're cringe. Dawn of War is fake. It's not real. We don't play it for a reason. So you just want to play Layout cool. Three and Four forever? Yeah. Fair enough. Those I mean, that is kind of that is kind of my favorite. They're also one. the best for my army, so they're the most balanced. Yeah. There is a mathematical world where you just only play on uh, three and four all yeah. weekend. <laughs> like, it's yeah. just 50 50. I would man. not complain. You just got to win six straight coin flips, dude. All right. Would you rather, Lucas, over the course of the weekend, never play on layout one or never not go first? I'd rather not play against Necrons. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, sweet. Uh, round five, we're breaking out layout F. Supply drop, chilling rain, search, and destroy. What do we uh, What do we think about this one, boys? It's the certainly the classic go second to pressure army. Uh oh, mission. <laughs> but you know, kind of is what it is, right? Yeah, I will say this is also our second search and destroy, which like I guess with six missions and no Dawn of War, you're gonna have to play Yeah, two of the deployments twice. I like that we're doing Crucible twice. If I had to pick one of the remaining three to double up on, I would probably pick sweeping, but I don't mind search and destroy. Um, I think at this point we're definitely looking at a packet. I mean, we'll get to talk about the last mission in a second, but I think we're looking at a, a player pack that generally tends to favor aggressive armies and board control armies. 
um, between the two search and destroys. We've got a vital ground in there. We've got a, a kill more, hold more mission, which tends to favor armies that like brawling. Um, so I think at this point, we're, we're definitely at a, a point where we can look at the mission pack and be like, yeah, if, if you play a, a mid-board style army, you're probably better than someone who's trying to camp in their deployment zone. But that's, uh, that's fine, because camping in the deployment zone is cowardly. I'll be fair. So I didn't want to make it like actively 100% hostile to a gunline army, but I did want to create a pack that encouraged um, dynamic situations where people had to like move and do things. And I know that putting out the pack early enough and seeing these missions it would also influence uh, army selection. Like Tanner hit me up. It was like, I see what you did. I'm not taking this other army. <laughs> like, okay, cool. <laughs> Yeah. And so, I mean, I guess there, if if somebody's favorite army is like a guard artillery line sitting on the backfield and never going out of their deployment zone, this is probably not going to be an incredibly enjoyable event. Uh, but I also like, don't think that's just fun to play against. Exactly. <laughs> so like, it's like, bummer, dude. Now you're experiencing what everyone experiences playing against you. And it's fine, guys. There's no US some, like, guard players. So that's okay. Mm -hmm. You add some bull yeah. and some like dynamic elements. You can still play that way. You just you have to you have to move a little on this mission pack, which I I really prefer versus I'm gonna sit here and shoot you until you stop twitching. Yeah, I think that of the deployments you can play supply drop on, search and destroy is unequivocally the worst one um, because there is the fundamental asymmetry in the two objectives, and oh no. I got the bad side of that flip and I can't take their safe objective out from under them. So I lose the game is a massive bummer. Um, that's my it's primary gripe with this, but Thanks, Tyler. yeah, <laughs> no problem. But uh, uh, yeah, if you want more info on what that's like, check out the last GT we went to. It hurt. Um, check it that out. Said, like, I, don't, I don't think we can we can blame Noah or Aegis for doing that because like this is the deployment no. type that GW recommends we play this primary on, and like every yeah. tournament that plays supply drop has this deployment type. It's like not a unique issue with Cascade. It's like a, an issue with nope. how we all perceive yeah. this primary. Yeah, absolutely. No. And it's not it's not terrible. At the end of the day, I was I was you're... a little I was hesitant to do custom to like go off of reservation like Cali Cup. Mm -hmm. Cali Cup did a great job, but I'm I was not confident enough personally for my first event to go that far off and be like, oh yeah, we're just gonna switch this up. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it makes sense. Totally like, the big thing that you're trying to do is like mimic Tacoma, right? Like which is the other like huge major around here. Um, I guess besides Slim Ashmas, but like I know that you're trying really hard to like get your event certified to be like golden ticket status. So like Next following year, in line with yeah, GW's recommended uh missions is definitely like the way to do that. So it's also something that like we were the question earlier about like making the event accessible for everybody. Um, I think it's also the thing that like people are if you're not a player who's playing a bunch of other stuff, like, you know, you're not playing the wide gamut of everything available to a competitive player. These are very familiar, and so they're a little more accessible. Yeah. Yeah, these are the missions that people are used you're to right. playing. Yeah, I could have done better on Mission 5. Games. Fantastic. And then, to round out the weekend, the championship mission of Cascade Clash is Mission I, Take and Hold, Hidden Supplies, Hammer and Anvil. So Hammer and Anvil rearing its head for the first time of the weekend in the six objective format on layout one and four. Now, Noah, before we jump into a discussion of this, my first question for you is, are you mandating a particular orientation of hidden supplies? Because it's not guaranteed one way or the other on Hammer and Anvil, or are you going to have everybody roll for it independently? Uh, I actually oh, hadn't like... given that one the thought yet. Uh, I think roll yeah. independently, maybe, but like only because Lucas just whispered it in my ear. <laughs> Here, here's my rationale for why I think we should roll independently. This is one of my favorite missions. Sorry, if you yeah. had anything to say, no, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 absolutely. I'm I'm here to learn. I this is a mission that's grown on me a lot lately. Hidden supplies is the um oh my god, I thought someone just dropped I dropped it out of the call. 
because the screen changed. Um, Hidden Supplies is the uh, bonus mission rule where the middle objective splits and goes toward one of the No Man's Land corners. And what Tyler's talking about there is on Hammer and Anvil, there are no No Man's Land corners, so you have to randomize which direction it goes. And I appreciate that you brought up these terrain layouts, Tyler, because it's very interesting which direction it goes. And um, so if it splits toward like the top left and bottom right corners, then what happens is the objectives move in a position where, you know, part of them is sheltered behind that kind of no man's land L. Whereas if they go in the other directions, it's kind of like out in the open, uh, kind of right in between all of those major pieces of terrain in no man's land. I think that split is, it, it's cool that it's random because it like, it makes the game feel a little different every time, but it's not enough of a huge swing like supply drop, right? Like supply drop, there's the, the pregame roles of like which objective matters most. And you can win or lose the game boss based on that role. You're not going to win or lose the game based off this role, but it helps the mi mission feel fresh um, because it, you know, introduces a new variable. Um, same thing on layout one. If we look, uh, it, you know, if you split the middle, it could either end up both objectives kind of in the open, but inside uh, that blunder dome, <laughs> or you can split it toward the five by 10 piece of terrain and have part of it end up on the other side of that. And that's an, another interesting dynamic, right? Like you have a somewhat sheltered objective in the latter case, and in the former case, you know, you're really brawling over this middle. And I think that's pretty cool. So I really like this mission. And that's why I think it should be random each time is because the game is different every time. And I think that's the best way to play Warhammer. Does anyone think it shouldn't be random each time? Dealing with Do you want to counterpoint? I, I, my counterpoint is exactly what Lucas said, but I'm going to draw the opposite conclusion, which is that Things should be as consistent from table to table as possible and saying, oh, man, and I was playing on the table where they were in the open and I got shot at. But at, oh, I was playing the same matchup, but they were behind the walls, so I didn't get shot at. Like, ah, eh, it's a bummer. Um, so I, I I, much prefer the, the certainty of knowing which way it is, regardless of which way you decide to make it. I don't have a particular preference. Um but that role can be pretty spicy. Um, and I would say more than that, though, the most important thing is that whichever decision you make with, I would put that in the pack, like put a little asterisk on supply drop and then put, yeah, yeah. because this is hammer and anvil, and you'll need to decide whether it goes one way or the other, roll for it at the table, um, just so not everyone finds themselves wondering that question and not having an answer to it. The one thing I will say about I think the I do it fixed. Oh, go ahead, Nicholas. Mm -hmm. The role happens before deployment, right? Nick. Yep. So, like, unlike search and destroy or supply drop, mm -hmm. um, yeah, where you have to deploy your whole army and then find out if you got lucky or unlucky, right? Like, do I have do I get to play defensively or do I have to run at them like a hooligan, right? Like, now you at least get to see, okay, knowing in deployment, knowing like before I like pick secondaries, right? Like before I just declare reserves and transports, like. I at least know if the objectives are out in the open or behind the walls. So I get to make a game plan mm -hmm. based off of that. I, I'm with you, Tyler. I, I definitely would love for yeah. it to be consistent because it would like it, it is kind of weird when you guys like to talk about like the matchup and you're like, oh, well, I got this, which fundamentally changed the matchup. Um, yeah. On honestly, I would even be okay if you rolled it for everyone at once, live at the event, Jason Bird style. Like that would yeah. be. I would prefer that. <laughs> to everyone roll it independently um, if you don't want to give people that level of information in advance. But just the looking over at, over at my at Nick playing next to me, longingly wishing that I got the split that he got, um, like, it's annoying. But up to you. You're, you're in charge here. I, I think, I think I'm, I'm, I'm going to – I'll take time to think about it, but I'm, I'm leaning mm -hmm. towards having it fixed by deployment. So if you're on deployment, this deployment, it splits – um, bottom left, top right, so that there's it's hidden, so that there's places to hide on the objective. And if you're on the mm -hmm. other deployment, it splits the opposite direction, so that there are places. Ooh. So basically, it, no point it ends in the open. So you, That's if I do a fixed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that way, there's somewhere to hide on objectives. <laughs> Otherwise, you're just like, hey, uh, this mission is a slaughter. So I hope you enjoy standing <laughs> in the open. <laughs> I mean, but for for the record, the like, thing is, I think if the, I do the roll. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I do the role, I'll probably I will probably generate it and then just give the answer for like everybody. Mm -hmm. 
for, for the record, we are talking about like the center objectives being replaced here with two objectives. So if we were not playing with the split, it would always be in the open. So like open is default behind walls is the change. Um, it's not like it becomes a slaughter when it wouldn't have been if it hadn't split, if you know what I'm saying. Uh, but I, 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 yeah, I think that's a very reasonable conclusion. Do you think that instead of rolling, um, which, like instead of rolling, hey, it goes up and down, it goes, you know, from top right to bottom left. Instead of rolling, instead of doing the, if you if I did the random determination, doing it, do they split in the way that is in the open or do they split in the way that is in the closed? Because then it's the same kind of experience regardless of layout. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, do you, one layout so gets the open, doing, one layout, yeah. layout gets hidden. We'll see. Like, is the annoying I, I part that I'm glad you, we you can look question. at your friends? Is the annoying part that you can look at your friend's table and say that they got they got the better split while you didn't, or is it just going to feel as annoying as like we determined randomly that the objectives are in the open or not pre-game? Like, how different really are those two things? If the objectives are going to split, there's going to be situations where they split in an unfavored or a favored way, depending on your matchup. Right, like there's no way to fix something so that everyone doesn't feel bad about the randomness of the split. So why don't we just have the split be random and then you know you get some of those disadvantageous situations. You're gonna get them regardless of whether or not you fix it beforehand or you don't. That's my opinion. These are all good arguments. Yeah, for sure. I'll think about cool. it. All right. So that is the mission pack. Uh, including all six of the missions. Um, we talked a lot about the decision point there. What do we think of this mission in general? Is good mission? Lucas is saying he likes it. I, I think it's a good mission as well. Um, uh, Hammer and Anvil with Hidden Supplies is always wild because like the, a lot of the rest of the missions, it definitely encourages a certain level of, of brawler or ness. Um, because... Uh, you got four whole objectives to hold, and they're all in a straight line down the middle, more or less. You know, all, there's a lot of fight around, and also suddenly you can hold two objectives by holding the center instead of just holding one. So I think it uh, it falls in line with a lot out of that, as opposed to pushing against some of what we've seen elsewhere. But if the goal is to make everyone go fight, I think this is uh, you have succeeded at that effectively. I'm excited for so some on fight. a mission pack of ranking A to F, each of you, what mm -hmm. did I get? What was my letter grade for the for the mission selection? A. I'll give you a solid B plus because I really hate <laughs> Mission Five, and I also hate Purge the Foe. Sure. But that's me personally. Mission Five, I think, is bad. <laughs> Purge the Foe, I don't like. So I'm not going to hold that against you. But I, I not a huge finish. I'll give you a B plus. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think you did the like like good job picking missions that aren't like like you did. You know, you you strayed away from the like missions that like people kind of generally agree are ridiculous. Um. Outside yeah. of the ritual being pretty annoying to play on, but like you have good terrain for it, so that's a plus. People who pick that mission without terrain that can detach from the plates are monsters. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I, I think this like discussion around this really just goes to show that we are very much in need of like small tweaks to some of these missions. Like we keep pointing out the same things, like oh, this primary is very fun, but on this deployment, if I go second, I auto lose. Like, you know those kind of words shouldn't be said about missions. Um, I know, I, I like the idea though, that you definitely put some thought into like, I want to take missions that are good for like a variety of styles of armies. Um, that is certainly like how these missions feel like they're designed. So yeah, I'd say overall, it looks fun. It looks exciting. There's some stuff in here. Uh, I haven't played Battleground in a while. I haven't played Ritual in forever. So, you know, I'm looking forward to playing. playing you some played it stuff. last week. But, but I haven't played it in an event. In <laughs> I played it last week to prepare for this event because I had not played it. In I, know, I know, I know. Yeah, very cool. Sweet. Well, that is Cascade Clash. It's going to be a ball and a biscuit. You're not going to want to miss it. It is happening next weekend, if you're listening in the future. That is to say the 9th and 10th of March in the year of our Lord 2024. Um as we said earlier, tickets are still available if you're in the Pacific Northwest region. This is happening in is it what is it labeled? Is it labeled as Mount Vernon? Is it labeled as Bellingham? I don't. What do, what do you what do you say it's officially? Mount it's the 
It's gotcha. at the Skagit it's Valley it. Fairgrounds in Mount Vernon, Washington. Fantastic. That's where it is. That's when it is. Is that that's what's happening? We'll all be there. If you're going to be there um, and you don't know us 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 yet, feel free you know, to stop by and say hi. I uh, always excited to know that more people are listening to the show, um, and we're uh, excited to see y'all there. Should be a good time. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to pitch about the event, Noah, or that Nick or Lucas wanted to ask about the event before we jump into what we're taking and how uh, how we're prepping for it? I'm just really excited that it's happening. I'm interested yeah, to see what it's y'all gonna be are great. Doing. Me too. It should be fun. Yeah, list lock is is it tonight at midnight or tomorrow night at midnight? Uh, I guess that's what I was gonna ask you. Yeah. It's tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, it's tomorrow, tomorrow at eleven fifty nine p.m. It's, it's tomorrow at eleven fifty nine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool, Sounds cool. good. Great. Are you gonna be there? So... Like ready to hand out yellow cards <laughs> once the clock gets midnight, dude? <laughs> Turn us into pumpkins. Um. <laughs> No, I, my thing about it is is like this: is if I'm probably gonna check it Monday afternoon, right? Like I'm gonna, I have a life. I'm gonna be asleep already, right? All right. If Monday you comes, in, if, if, it's, if it's three, <laughs> if it's if it's three o'clock on an app on Monday, and I don't see your list, I'm gonna reach out to you. If I don't hear a response that day, yeah, you're gonna get a yellow card, and you're gonna you're gonna get ten points off your first round. It's just like because we I already got the confirmation from Adam Camilleri that they're going to talk about um, the event, and I would like to unlock the lists as soon as possible. Um, so, really, it's just for the experience of everybody else. But like, please don't make me have to yellow card you. That's what I would like not to do. Please, you heard it like, first, ladies and gentlemen. List lock is Monday night. It's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> If you're yeah, if, if everyone else, Monday, if you're Steve Trimble, it's Monday afternoon. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, sweet. Well, we'll uh, with that in mind, our list may not be a hundred and fifty percent locked in here, but I do want to talk a little bit about what it is that we are bringing and plan on submitting. Um, I know that uh, you know the last fifty points of your list, you can be up all night talking about. But let's start with Lucas because I think he's got the. Um, the most straightforward answer, I think. What 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 are you taking a cascade, Abe Lucas? The orcs, I imagine. I am taking Necrons. I am taking four Catan. I am taking two rocks. I am taking forty warriors. I move block. I stand. <laughs> I bore. I snore. I teleport. Uh, no, I'm playing. Cool, dude. Explain to me why you yeah. that shift. It's such a uh, yeah, that's a pretty I radical. Like watching my opponent fall asleep as I did whatever I want to. Um, did you also I- fall asleep? Uh, <laughs> yes, as long as there's Necrons at the table, I'm absolutely falling asleep. If if I get a pairing in the, and I'm playing Necron, which I am going to be next week, and I'm playing in the mirror matchup, I'm just going to fall asleep before I even make it to the table. Um, so yeah, I'm playing Chaos Knights. Um, after an extensive amount of, not like extensive, I played like maybe a dozen games with the Lancer, 10 to 12 games with the Lancer. Um, I feel like she's a lot stronger on GW train than she was on WTC, and a lot of my testing was on WTC just because I wanted to see if it had any applicability um, for teams. And I feel like, you know, kind of counterintuitively, I think I've said this before on the show, but like it, it's honestly weaker um, the more dense your terrain is, which you think like if you're able to hide a big knight, it's much stronger, but you lose so much movement with her. Um, kind of like rotating, pivoting around, especially because like, you know, it's just a big bulky night. So it is hard to kind of wedge into a lot of those narrow corridors that you have on WTC tables. And especially if your opponent is like smart with positioning, they can uh, kind of deny your charges and movement really heavily. So um, decided to not take the Lancer. A um, lot better on GW tables, but I think still uh, having three knights instead of one is just like, probably a little more optimal so um i have two stalkers i've got five brigands and i've got five carnivores i'm taking stalkers over huntsmen even though they give up assassinate because i think the mortar hat is really powerful um there's still like some people with their little scrap uh, garbage units and like holes and big bulk units are really powerful right now and one of the best ways to counter that kind of thing is to remove everything that's not that so if you can have your mortar hats kill their cultists, their nerglings, their scarabs, swarms, their scouts in the first turn or two, then you're going to be in a great spot. I also think the stalker rule is like pretty good. Uh, plus one to wound. Um, 
getting that, you know, once you make it to the wound step, there's a lot of people that are like, you know, my Catan teleports to a corner and is on its own. Well, if you have two stalkers shoot that Catan, then the reliability of wounding on twos is pretty good. Um, and especially, like, once you wounded, like, it's just as good at killing a Catan as a Brig of Melta. So that's pretty good. Um, and then, you know, it's also just a cheap crap dog. You can throw forward early if, uh, you know, you you want to save your Carnivores and Brigands to actually do stuff. So um, kind of just the same old 12 dog lists, tried and true. Not especially exciting, but um, I enjoy playing it. So I'm looking forward to it. And I'm also almost done. I'm try I'm going to try. It depends how busy I am next week. But I'm going to try to have all of my dogs um, fully painted, not just three colored by them. So um, I've been working on my brigands over the course of the last week or two, and they're looking pretty good. Um, I'm going to try to throw the decals on over the course of the day today. So I'm looking forward to it because my knights have looked like shit for a while, and um, I think my condors look really cool. So getting the brigands to that level is going to be pretty sick. Hell yeah, man. So to to recap, because we got to kind of first there, the full list is 12 dogs, which is five carnivores, five brigands, two stalkers. Stop. Yep. Cool. And then what's the demon contingent? Uh, two squads of three Nurglings and a Beast of Nurgle. Sounds good. Always love to see Princess making an appearance. Um, awesome. Sweet. What about you, Nick? What are you taking a Cascade Clash? Oh, look. It's the Beast of Nurgle. It's very good. Those things are pretty funny. And now you don't have to take out a second mortgage on your home to buy an army of them. Um, yeah, I, after much deliberation and probably playing Necrons, Yahoo, I'm going to be teleporting around and malding about scrambler fields and, uh, I'm playing three Catan, not four like Lucas, um, and only one rock, not two, um, you know, a little more daring. There's a little more stuff in the list. Actually, I don't know if four and Catan and two rocks and 40 warriors fits in the list anyway. So, um, Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, we're gonna be. Hmm. What is a rock? You need to cut like a monolith. You don't know what a, a rock is. A monolith, dude. Okay, okay, yeah. You I walk up to the table and drop a massive rock into their DZ, and you go, "I am getting my secondary points." Sorry about the monolith, dude. Yeah. That, yeah, I don't know. The list is funny. Um. Yeah. It's it's cool. Do we want to like, talk about hypercrypts? Or... Yeah, I mean the 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 point the point of this was to not have to spend twenty minutes next in two weeks talking about what our what's in our list and why we took it. Okay. So that that episode uh, could be shorter because we have some games to cover. Yeah. Talk about uh, I, mean, the, I think one of the good. interesting things is that most people are just taking warriors to fire and fade. So talk about the plasmancer. Yeah. So the plasmancer is is a potential unit being brought in the list. Um, he is most commonly seen with like immortals. Uh, he turns your what he gives you crit fives. So like he makes warriors who have lethal hits on sixes like lethal hits on fives now. And then you take that enhancement. That's every time you get like picked up, put down, you get full hit rerolls. So now you just have a unit of guys with forty shots that are fishing for fives that auto wound and they're AP one. And if Zaris is nearby, they're AP two. Um, so it's just like a good kind of like pinpoint damage you can just drop down and blast people with. And it's really nice paired with the monolith because, like, you can just keep pulling them to the monolith uh, after it, like, redeploys and deep strikes. So, it's a fairly hitty unit. It's, like, you know, not impossible to kill. Um, but just being able to, like, relocate that amount of damage into one thing can be pretty nice. So, yeah. Um, I know a lot of people are talking about the Chronomancer with the Warriors, like dropping in and fire and fading and like taking primary and move blocking and all that good uh, nonsense. So, yeah. That's basically the only difference I think in our version of the list is the Plasmancer and Chrono instead of double Chrono. And then it's got like, you know, some Locusts. Uh, it's got the Three Catan, Nightbringer, Void Dragon, Transcendent. Um, we're not rid of the Deceiver as much as I'd love to. Because he's bad. Um, <laughs> then we got the rock, which unlocks a ton of just options in the army. Um, the like being able to pull the infantry across for just an extra free movement, um, being able to pull infantry to objectives to flip them, um, being able to pull Zaris across the table because for some reason that guy's infantry instead of a monster. 
so you can pull them to your warriors and provide the aura buff um, which is pretty nice and a big thing too that a lot of people i mean like the model looks fairly popular now after matt laura won olvio with it um but like a big thing about hypercrypt is getting your stuff tagged is really bad because it can't teleport and like you have no fallback and do anything um but the monolith's like ability to pull things out of combat um you just pull it to the monolith they didn't fall back they're not eligible to charge but they are eligible to shoot um so it makes that plasmancer unit really strong if your opponent's game plan is to just tag it to shoot. you can just keep pulling it and getting full hit rerolls so they have to like actually full commit to it and then you've got the funny 2CP blink away if you punch me strat. <laughs> so just another cool thing the model with unlocks. But yeah, um, that's pretty much the list. I know we've been like back and forth on a few, like just kind of like what, what trash units to take and which amount and what thing. But the core of the list kind of just remains the same. Yeah, for sure. Uh yeah, so yeah, Lu Lucas is joking that he's also taking Necrons. It's funny because Nick and I are both taking Necrons, and we're both taking basically the same list here. Um, the only distinction in trash units that I know of, what 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 have you settled on, Nick, for your for your trash accoutrement? We were back and forth on that a lot. I know. Are you I on the? Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, at least well, at least he's... two locusts and the scarab seems good, but mm -hmm. there's like you know Sounds anything good. they could throw in that last like 50, 60 points doesn't really change it that much. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, the only thing that I'm doing that might be a little bit different is one of my personal consideration for what to do with those last 50, 60 points is that I really like taking a solo Chronomancer to fill that at Void as opposed to just taking another Locust. Um, the Chronomancer data sheet hands out minus one to hit if he's leading, but he fire and fades always. So he's a dude on a 40 who can fire and fade. And he's a dude on a 40 with a four up invuln. So as compared to like another, the third Locust, which is what he was previously for me, he picks up a bunch of utility, uh, and he also has the infantry keyword, which is really great, uh, because like Nick said, with the monolith on the table, you want to be sucking infantry to it as often as possible. And he then unlocks the option to rearrange your characters and have both warrior squads have chronomancers and leave the plasmancer on his own to just go around doing mortals. Uh, if that is more advantageous, which it might be on Scrambler Fields Ritual, because Ritual Scrambler Fields drop blocks reserves. It doesn't block reserves that then fire and fade. Um, it's actually one of the only times when gargoyles are better than uh, acolytes at taking primary. Um, and uh, so they're good for that. But the warriors can just line up outside and move on. So if you don't need the plasmancer damage, having the second chronomancer available to get more of that kind of nonsense going on also seems quite useful. But yeah, same core of the list. Void Dragon, Nightbringer, Transcendent, and Xeris. Chronomancer, second Chronomancer, Plasmancer, so seven whole characters, which is a bunch. Two bricks of 20 warriors, two solo locusts, a, so a squad of scarabs, um, and that's everything. It's definitely pretty light on the ground. Yeah, um, not a lot. But, uh, <laughs> each of those pieces hit real hard. Sweet, so that's kind of where we're on that. We, we're at on that. Look forward to our episode in two weeks uh, covering that. And we've got just a couple other listener questions that I wanted to blast through here. Uh, for some of us, uh, and then we'll sign off of here. Um, so Sam asks, with Tyler and Nick following a similar archetype in the Necron build, what is your process for making changes based on the information and results received at Pyra? Obviously, our list here is based on Andrew Gagno's list that he took to Pyra, um, and now he's played Pyra, and he did pretty well. So what do, what do, what do you think in the, having having seen those results, Nick? What's what's How's that impacting your list writing decisions? Yeah, I mean, he pointed out some interesting stuff that he, like, you know, found, like, these are some, like, definitely strengths of the list. These were, like, some weaknesses that were exposed that I didn't really, like, consider before. And he, like, brought up some stuff that he would change. And I definitely agree with, like, some of that stuff. Um, I know, like, uh, one of the things we were talking about was, like, maybe cutting a Catan, just because there's so many points for something that only, like, moves six and is rather inconsistent, because it's, like, low volume of attacks with no rerolls. Um, and they also hate invulns. Throw a unit with a four up invuln at them, and you will bog them down in combat for like forever. Um, so, uh, I definitely agree with that. It's kind of the question of like, what would you trade it out for at this point with list lock literally, you know, 20, like less than a little more than 24 hours away, basically a day away, and like hobbying. <laughs> um, I don't want to change the core of our list too much because like that's what we've been practicing, that's what I've got ready. 
Um, but it's definitely something that I'm going to like be paying attention to with my games at Cascade. Like, are these weak? You know, uh, could they be changed? That sort of thing. Yeah, I'm in, I'm in a similar sort of position here. I think the Void Dragon in particular is just right on the chopping block. I want him out of the list. Um, but, I mean, I, I bought the Void Dragon the day it came out out like several years ago and painted it and love that model and have been wanting to bring him to a tournament having lent him to nick to bring to tournaments in the past several times like i really want to take that guy to a gt god damn it so even if it's not an optimal People choice love that model, dude. Great to put him on the table he's very Every cool. time they come to me, they're like i love how you painted him and i'm like well actually it's my friend tyler bortel who's like way over there you should go tell him thank you or like i was borrowing it when you were out of, yeah, yeah, out, of sure. uh, out of the state mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah. well, I'll send a message to my buddy Tyler and tell him <laughs> how much he loved his model. But yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to throw him down. I think that he comes out. I think Emotech comes in um, because I don't know about you, but mm -hmm. I have been absolutely desperate for some goddamn command points. With um, the model and Emotech is yeah, absolutely with the model. Like, yeah. Yeah. I think Something particularly we as I find myself taking fixed more and more as a function of time. Yeah. I need access to command points somehow, and he's the only other option that I know of. Yeah, um, yeah it's, also it's, not, like... it's not just the... the. I mean, the monolith, obviously, the strats are, are really, really good, and most of them in Hypercrypt focus on it, but it also is like the army is just wants a lot of CP rerolls, right? Like CP rerolls for Catan and Bones are, are super valuable depending on the matchup. You're going to, uh, they move six. So like you're rerolling their nine inch charges to flip primaries. You're rerolling their, yep. you know, six and seven inch charges when you waddle forward. So it's not just that you need the strats for the, 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 the Catan, but you're also like CP rerolling a lot. And if you're taking fixed, you have 10 CP over the course of the game to play with. One of those for CP rerolls or two of them for CP rerolls is like a lot proportionally, especially in the early yeah. game. Yeah, because the big thing with that list that we were noticing is you're using the three inch deep strike, at maybe not turn one, but you're you're at least using it four or five times a game, right? So that's already five of your ten CP. And if you're playing the monolith, you want to be able to threaten the the two CP pull away, like you know if your opponent doesn't commit mm -hmm. enough. Uh, other things too is like interrupting with Catan can be very valuable. Epic challenging with Catan can be very valuable. Like Lucas said, sometimes you haven't been like threatening those strats is very powerful. So having that bank of CP and then like sometimes your opponent never forces you to use that and you like end up on turn three with like six CP. Because I played Emotech a little bit because I was playing Laura's list as my first mm -hmm. foray into Hypercrypt. And sometimes you look down and you're all like, I have six cp what am i gonna do with this and then you just start sinking them to Catan and making your opponent's life miserable so yeah i i agree Mo takes a strong choice he's also a thing that can just sit on the backfield because he's a guy on a 40 he can block out the you know three inch deep strikes and stuff and he yeah is he's really and well, right? he also he has a two up save yeah he's like yeah. six or seven wounds with a two up the one needs to deep strike something um, real in the backfield to kill him yeah, he's not going to die to PBCs or Havoc launchers. It'll take Garden direct, like, concerted effort to kill him. Like, they'll be able to do it, but it'll take a while. Whereas, like, a single Locust back there is, like, sometimes, like, ah, and just dies. He dies you know? instantly, yeah. yeah. He he also can do the um do the Typhus thing where you pick him up on turn two once you can actually Strat Reserve walk him into your opponent's DZ, and you're like, cool, this guy's going to do homers until the end of time. Yeah. My Transcendent Catan is free to go do something else now. Um, He's another infantry. Model. Seems good. He is an infantry model. He can get glocked. Um, but yeah, so I think I think he comes in. That leaves us with like 120 or 30 points after that, which is like rough. Um, it probably looks like more trash. Um, I yeah. want it to be a Triarch Stalker, but that's not correct. It's correct to take more trash. Um, so it probably looks like the third Lockest on like a squad out of Scarabs and maybe an LHD, which is crazy because that means that the damage went up zero when we took out a damage piece. Um and like it's yep. already not a very it's high a little, damage army, so I'm, I'm not entirely rough. sure. But yeah. yeah, so those are those are some of the thoughts. Look forward to those, especially once we have a uh, casket under our belt. Um, great question here from uh from Sam. Um, forgot I'm supposed to pull these up like this. Uh, Sam asked with WTC and Team America. Uh, each being a primary focus, I imagine, and in Noah's case, Team Mexico. Uh, how do you prepare for a singles event and with um? WLD. Win loss I don't know what draw. that means. Oh, with win loss draw on a non WTC yeah. terrain out, are you limiting yourself in terms of changes and using, using it as a testing and practice event? I think this is a fantastic question. What do you think about this, Lucas? 
Yeah, it's something that I've not struggled with. That's not the right word, but like been thinking about a lot recently with, um, you know, I've I recently been kind of like assigned Death Guard for Team USA because it was a gap in our roster. So I've been like learning a new faction, but also trying to find practice time for it in the middle of a now more bu busy schedule, um, playing both singles and teams. It's like, is it worth it to go practice it in singles events? And for some armies, the difference of terrain can be massive. Like Death Guard, I feel like on GW Train, um, the list plays so much differently than it does on WTC. So I was like trying to apply some of those lessons. Um, it's just a completely different ball game. Whole pieces, things like Brigands and Mortarian are super good on GW because of the nature of like, you know, moving 12 and shooting or like having a really tough piece to stage with in the midboard and then leap out really far is really powerful like mortarian can run up into that little l is in the middle of layout four and then run out into your and charge into your opponent's tz on turn two like that's something he can totally do whereas in wtc like it takes that guy three turns to reach the midfield objective just because of how the l's work like it it's it's that bad so just thinking in terms of train formats but also um you know pushing for differentials like i think it was did sam ask this question yep so, like Sam said, um, thinking not in terms of win loss draw, but a differential. Like we're we're thinking uh, about completely different games here. So, um, preparing for a singles event, um, you can definitely. Uh, I think there's a lot of lessons, uh, despite the fact that you know it, it is a different game with different terrain and different goals. You can still take the same lessons. There's still like f core fundamental things about every singles game you play that can apply to teams. And the first is just like, what is your general sense of the matchup? How do the profiles line up into each other? You can play a whole game with your opponent feel like, I can't kill anything this guy has. He has more OC than me. The numbers just aren't lining up. I can't kill him efficiently. He can vibe check me, vibe check me super well, and there's nothing I can do about it. That's probably, you know, still a good lesson to take to a team and, tell, and say, you know, even though, uh, caveat, we play this on a GW table and with this X mission that we don't play at WTC, but I just feel like the numbers don't line up super well here. Can we can I play this into someone this week and we can confirm that on WTC terrain? So it's I I kind of take it as like a primer of like here's these ideas, here are the things that I'm the vibe that I'm getting from a matchup. Um now let's apply that in a team setting. So it's kind of like a it, it's a it's a baseline, it's not the whole story, but it can kind of tell you how to generally feel about a matchup. How do you guys feel about it? Yeah, yeah I, I feel like this the second question kind of answers the first. Um Swarm is in a very similar place to Death Guard in terms of it is so much better on WTC terrain than it is on GW terrain um, because of the ability to basically not get shot on long angles. Um, so often when I try to play Swarm on GW, I find myself try having to reach out way further than realistic from my home base. That tendril style that it wants to play just works so much better if there aren't all these random able long angles to get shot from and most of my army is just generally safe until i start exposing things that i care about in the right places especially as a defender who usually gets table choice like going from table choice in wtc to gw is disastrous um and that's a big part of why i don't feel like i'm like missing out on wtc prep by not playing it at gw train events um in addition to that uh there's definitely a little bit of uh of how useful is data into random matchups in general. And with the swarm, I don't think that's especially impactful right now. Whereas something like Necrons where I'm, this is like a formal assignment, like I'm supposed to be playing them for the team, but also is just something that I'm not super used to yet. All of the games are useful for my development as a player, even if they don't necessarily re rely on the terrain the same way. Um, I will say that uh, Hypercrypt in particular, not nearly as terrain dependent as some other armies is do. I think it plays pretty well on, on WTC. It might play a little bit better on GW the more I think about it, but you know we'll, we'll see that in the actual event review. Um, but I don't think that I am building a particularly different list than I would be playing in WTC. Uh, I don't know if I would call that limiting myself, but I'm definitely not thinking, oh, like I'm not out here playing Thunderwolf Cavalry because I think that, you know, it's great on GW. It is. It's terrible on WTC, so it's not even entering my brain as a consideration. Um, yeah. So yeah, I am limiting myself in that way, I guess you could say. What do you think, Nick? Yeah, I, I kind of agree with Lucas. Um, I mean, I mostly agree with Lucas that it's... I, I take away my singles games like 
that data that I take away from those for teams is certainly just like how my army interacts with their army. Like, how do my profiles fare into theirs? How do their profiles fare into me? Um, like, how does like the general flow of the game work? Are they absolutely crushing me? Can I kill them efficiently? That sort of thing. Um, I try to pay less attention to like, okay, if I stage this here, then like I can threaten these. Cause like you're playing on completely different, you know, terrain sets on WTC. Um, <clears throat> and big things too is like when people play like big dumb models, you know, it's like, okay, well, <laughs> like, is this going to fit on a WTC board? You know, like how realistic is this game here? Like as soon as people start bringing those out, it's kind of like, all right, well, this isn't really like, I'm not going to like care too much about what happens in this game. So yeah. Um, I think that's, that's certainly the big things that I take away from, from them. Very cool. And as one of the newest members of the WTC community, Noah, what are you thinking about uh, as you start to make that transition into focusing on WTC-oriented terrain maps and games? But I don't know, GW is kind of the standard for you, but how, how, where, where, where are you at in, in your journey on that? Uh, WTC is really different, and I've played some on it. I need to start playing more on it. Um, I think, you know, there's people, like, running around, like, seeing the praises right now of, like, double rampager on games workshop and flg and i think that's like just completely not a, like like imperial knights and two big knights in um wc is probably just not, not an option one big knight because you can shades especially one big knight like a lance that has a lot of movement i think it's still something to consider but it's definitely where like there's a lot of testing to be done and i don't know if i'm actually playing chaos knights or whatever for wc but that's that is something that is usually good to have in your back pocket for a team composition. So I'm definitely going to at least make sure I know what the mashup is like. Makes sense. Sweet. Um, next question. And we've only got, I think we do like two more of these here. Uh, Sam, a different Sam this time. This is Sam Sando. Uh, and let's see how many parts. Uh, there's some three questions. All right, for everyone. Uh, you guys talk about identifying situations where you just need to hang it out there and hope you get first turn or some other version of throwing a Hail Mary. How do you approach that against an unknown opponent with an unknown skill? This is such a good question. If you know that, that at, uh, against Big Bad, at your only chance is to play the line and go first, will you instead try to play a more normal game and hope you can overcome the matchup with skill? And I feel like there's kind of two different versions of this question, which is one in which you know you have a skill advantage, not to be... You know, speak disparagingly of your opponent, but you feel more comfortable in the matchup than they do, or two, you have no idea what's across the board from you. You know, you're at a you're at a, you're at a big event where you're playing someone who you've never met before. Like what are what are we gonna do about this, Lucas? I think the most important thing to identify is you come to the table and you think about what your opponent's game plan is first. I'll give two great examples of situations where I'll show up to the table um and this is something that I've realized in over the course of various metas in ninth edition, but also in 10th edition as well with guard. Now you show up, you think about your opponent's game plan and it is like, does their game plan have little or nothing to do with where I deploy? If the answer to that question is yes, then you should deploy as aggressively as possible to take as big a, a, a advantage, a big an opportunity, like um, as pop I'm phrasing this terribly, but like if you go first, you have the most tempo in your favor as possible instead of being hiding for no reason. So like, Great example of this, ninth edition, Tau, right? Like, if you went second against them or first, regardless, they were going to move their crisis suits 22 inches, blow you to hell, and then fire and fade away. They were going to move their bombers over you, bomb you, and shoot you. It doesn't matter if you deploy defensively or aggressively. Um, they're going to do the same things to you. So you may as well deploy more or less on the line. And if you go first, then you have a massive tempo advantage. Same thing in the guard now. Their direct shooting pieces are like two LAS cannon sentinels and a tank commander. And then there's like six artillery pieces. 20% of that firepower is direct fire. 80% is indirect. So why are you bothering hiding? You're just denying yourself like eight inches of movement. Deploy on the line and go be as aggressive as possible. Guard hate being tagged. So very similar kind of uh, approaches there. Um, so if you see a situation where you're thinking it doesn't really matter and like so one of the best times to do this is when you you get to the table and you feel defeated already you're like my opponent's just gonna blow me to hell this is an unfavored matchup in right in that moment try to train your mind to think of it in terms of okay what is my out my out is that i play super aggressively or my out maybe is it's unfavored enough that my out is to go first 
So give yourself as good a chance as possible by by playing to those outs. Um, if you sit behind a wall and go second against an unfavored matchup, yeah, you're going to lose. So like, why not try, take every opportunity possible, especially in a singles format, to try to win that game by being aggressive? Oh, and then also like uh, about about unknown opponent with unknown skill, like especially if you're feeling unfavored, um, just try to flip the game on its head. You're not going to win by playing conventionally. So um, yeah, like especially if you're going up like against a really skilled player, some like a big name perhaps, or that's not an unknown opponent with unknown skill. But like, say you're going up against someone that you don't know if they're a really good player or not. If they are really, if they're not a really good player, then you'll probably have a skill advantage. If they are a really good player, then you can um, try to put them in an uh, unusual, like unknown scenario by by being very aggressive. Gotcha. A lot of good stuff in there. Um, not entirely sure that we we got to the heart of the question on on that one. Nick, do you have some other thoughts on this? If you got something lined up, go ahead first. Steve. Yeah, um, I think that it is really right because they're talking about a pretty specific scenario here, which is like, oh, I'm playing my worst matchup, right? I'm playing freaking, uh, you know, I'm, I'm playing Swarm into Grey Knights or I'm playing Swarm into Chaos Knights or whatever. But my, or I'm playing GSC into Chaos Knights. This is GSC into Chaos Knights is the best example for this. I'm playing GSC into Chaos Knights. That's a terrible matchup. I've played it into Arna. I've played it into Lucas. I've played it a bunch of times. And whenever someone knows what they're doing, they ragdoll me with it. It's so bad. Um, but I get paired into it round one. Never met this guy before. It could be anyone. If I'm playing into Lucas, I'm setting up for some really crazy aggressive maneuvers in the just hope against hope that uh, that he'll, he'll make he a mistake. I don't know that I'm doing that against anybody, right? Like if I if I'm not convinced that you know the matchup as well as, as I do, I might try to stick to my regular game plan and and see how oh it goes. And I feel like that's kind of what they're trying to ask about here. Um, I try to make a decision not just based on where is on how is the matchup, but also where in the event am I right now? Is this round one, and I'm still going to have to play five more games after this, or is this round five? And like this is kind of it, and you know maybe this guy Cinderella here, maybe he's he's really good. I don't know. If it's the beginning of the event, I'm gonna play it pretty casual, probably. I'm gonna I'm gonna see how it goes because I don't need to set up a massive massive play only when I could have maybe won the game other ways. Like I'm gonna feel bad if I, if I put it on the line and then get obliterated because I put everything on the line and then watch that guy go one and four that weekend. And be like, man, yeah, I guess that that feels awful to me. Um, if I feel like there was a, a game that could have been won there, and I and I threw everything on the line for nothing and ruined my tournament experience, like, I'm not going to do that. What, what what do you think, Nick? Um, so I think if you're in the situation um, where you're playing against a matchup that you know you like won't win going second, like you're kind of in the situation, like I'm pretty doomed. Like I have a five percent chance of victory if I go second. You know, like less than that, right? And I got to deploy on the line. I remember this happening a lot with Lucas in Ninth Edition with his orcs. Um, there were so many matchups that we realized, like, if I hide and I go, even if I go first and hide, like, I'm not getting to them. Uh, if I go second out in the open, I get blown up. So, like, why not go out in the open and hope I go first um, and just run at them? And that's, like, the situation you're in. So, like, part of that is, I, like, you've played the matchup enough to identify that. So if you're playing, like, an unknown matchup, if you're like, oh, I think this is really bad for me if I go second, like don't deploy like completely on the line, ready to lose the game on a coin flip, unless you're absolutely sure that that's like how it works. If you want to do it, go ahead. But like, yeah, if you're unsure about the matchup and their skill level, like maybe don't <laughs> deploy hyper aggressively and just play the game, you know, like how you'd normally play, you know, like a little more conservative deploy, like, you know, so they can't like alpha you turn one, that sort of thing. Um, but I think a big thing here is, um, you should probably try, at least for me, like, I don't really think too much about the skill level of my opponent when I'm playing against them. I, I definitely look at lists and I look at like, how would this list exploit my list? It, it's, it's a little bit of like, at least <laughs> it's a little bit of a detriment to me because sometimes I look at a list and I'm like, oh my God, this list is insane. If they do this and this and this to me, like they're going to destroy me. And then I show up to the table 
like planning around that and then they don't do like any of those things to me and i'm like oh that game was so easy what the heck happened that might happen as well if you know like this matchup is doomed if i go second i'm gonna deploy on the line Sometimes you go second, and sometimes they don't know how to exploit going first. Like they didn't deploy. I think that's exactly what he's what Sam is talking about here. Is yeah. do is do you take that risk, and how do you make that decision? You do. You assume your opponent knows what they're doing. I think I think that's how you should play the game. You assume your opponent is good at Warhammer. If you ever go into a game and be like, my opponent's <laughs> bad at Warhammer, prepare to get surprised. Like you're gonna get sometimes like slam dunked, like punched in the throat for that. You know, assume that they're good at Warhammer. And if they're bad, like, cool, you just got rewarded. Like, you, you, I've seen Lucas do this where he was like, this is a terrible matchup. I auto lose to guard if I go second. I need to deploy on the line. He went second. The guy didn't know his target priority. Lucas was like, oh my God, my army's still alive. And then he won the game. Like, if he deployed, like, oh, this guy's really good. I'm going to hide. And then the guy messed up his turn one. Lucas would be like punching himself in the head, like, well, now I can't exploit him messing up. And I still lose, you know, because he gets a second turn to shoot me. Yeah, I feel I feel like the question asker is, is asking from the opposite perspective of I'm gonna get I like I'm gonna get punished for going second no matter what. Like anyone with, with a brain can just shoot my stuff if I put it on the line. The question is, will I get punished for not doing that? If you played the maybe matchup I will, enough, maybe I will. like you know, yeah. Like if you played the matchup enough that you so, know that it's auto lose going second, like regardless got, of skill. But like so think 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 about think about for example at the at the Go for it, Noah. You got you got, you got some dad. Oh, I was gonna say this literally was my round five at the last event I went to. So mm -hmm. I go to my round five. I'm playing against Vanguard, played by Kazra from Art of War. I know Kazra's mm -hmm. a good player, but he and I haven't played for a while, and he's been repping with Team Canada. So I don't know his actual skill level at the moment. I have respect for him, so I'm going into it like a respectful situation. But neither of us know how well the other one understands the matchup. And I think that's the, that was the important thing. So I think that's one big thing is like you, as you're playing any game, there's a lot of positions to gain data you didn't have. So you might go in and not know the matchup or might not know how skilled they are, but you know what you understand. Like, you know what you know, but you don't know what your opponent knows. So as you take actions, their response will tell you what they do or do not know. So I placed some units, he placed some units. And as we were placing, I realized that I thought I potentially understood the deployment dynamic potentially better than he did. And so I held back five, I didn't deploy um, my close combat, my carnivores at all. And I kept two brigands. And when he deployed Marnius, I slammed all five of those models on the line on the quarters deployment so that they were literally like all going to shoot, all going to charge on turn one if I went first. Because I knew I was outmatched. I knew I could play around and screen and I could do some stuff and, and play the, the ley lines. So I was going to play a I was going to play a safe game. When I saw that my opponent potentially didn't understand the situation the way I understood it, I tried I, I intended to capitalize on it. And I think Vanguard is massively. Um, favored in that matchup and it ended up being a five point game right and it's like like i think that's for me the heart of this question is you might not you have to take every opportunity whether it's in deployment whether it's in um the first turn to understand what your like how much information your opponent has versus who understands it better and whoever understands the trade better is the one who wins i think in those situations i usually set up more centrally in like a medium position where I can audible to a hyper aggressive mode or recede. And I'm waiting for my opponent to tip their hand and say, this is how I understand the matchup. If my opponent says something like, oh, I need to kill this thing or I lose the game. Okay, cool. You just told me how you understand the matchup. If you're wrong, I am going to play entirely different now because I know what you're going to do. But if you're right, then I know now how well my opponent understands what's happening. And I have to do things that offset it. Against Tyler, we played a teams back in uh, ninth edition, and I think Tyler understood the matchup better than I did in the beginning. And I saw what he was doing, and he took my home objective. And I had to play. I was playing knights and needed to go back to like get my points. But I opted to go all the way into Tyler's deployment zone. So I thought Tyler understood it better than I did. And then when I realized that, like I thought my game was I had to take his side, and he thought his game was he had to take my side. I realized that, like, oh, I'm just going to take his side. 
And that gave me the information I needed. I had to hang mid table till I knew how he understood it. And he fully, I mean, you fully expected me to go back and take the objective. You were like, what the hell are you doing, Noah? <laughs> and I think like that's yeah, it was a good being move. able to throw mm-hmm. plays in that your opponent doesn't expect, which is Tyler's bread and butter, like playing GSC, being able to like throw someone a curveball when you understand that they don't understand the matchup, like or understand the current situation well enough. Being able to know when to throw those crazy curveballs, I think, is the thing that like are like the backbreaking game moments. Yeah, I think you're really onto something there with the like. If you walk in with an information gap on your opponent like that, your goal is to fill it as quickly as possible, right? Don't continue to live in the dark and think. Spend all your time like, oh man, what is he doing? There's information in front of you. Watch what he deploys. Like, watch how he deploys. Right, like. One of my biggest litmus tests of does my opponent have an idea of what they're doing is I play in the Marines all the time. I'm like, okay, cool. I am the defender. Or is, oh, dang, you are the defender. Okay, cool, cool. What's your first drop? Is it five scouts right where I probably pretty obviously want to put a neurolictor? No, it's not that. It's something in your deployment zone. Great. This is over immediately. Like you, you, you have not played this enough, and I'm going to exploit that now. Um, but by contrast, I see, oh, snap, he's deploying his scouts out aggressively to push back on my infiltration because he knows that I can't really punish him for that. Damn it. Backpedal, right? Like, figure out what those, those opening moves should be, in your opinion, in your understanding of the matchup. And if they disagree, figure out what's going on in their head. How do they think this is going to work so you can play accordingly? That's a great answer, No, I'm really glad we had John to answer that because... Because they might understand it better kind of than around you. For a while. That, that is a total possibility. That has happened a lot of times. <laughs> Um, I, uh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and it also, it also might not be, I'm fucked. It might be, oh, this is actually mega favored for me. And I did not understand that. Right. Like this, this happened, um, in my, in my game yesterday, uh, against double Android or redeemer with swarm. I was like his, his early drop was he slammed a redeemer behind a wall. And I'm like, what are you doing, dude? Like, that's ridiculous. And then later on he explains, oh, the redeemer doesn't fit through any of these gaps. The only places it can go are here and here. So by putting it behind the wall, it completely zones you off of my home field and guarantees that I can fight for the points that I can get while not worrying so much about trying to win. Because this is a fucked matchup for me. And I'm like, oh, I thought I was about to get roasted. You just, I didn't see that. You saw the stuff. You saw why this was bad for you. It might not be either, either you, you, yeah, you can be wrong in both directions. It can be better or worse for you. Um, and your opponent might just see that and you don't. Okay. Ah, uh, big question from Luke, and then I'll hit all the GSC questions quickly because we just get a lot of GSC questions these days. Um, because I don't talk about GSC enough, apparently. I actually have to drive um, for family. Oh, comments. oh, I, we did. Guys. We did tell you 100 minutes, and it has been 120. Thank you so much for joining us, Noah. We'll see you next week. Yeah. You're awesome. We love having cool. you here. Take care, Thanks man. Later. You're all wonderful. You know, bye. I know. Love you, buddy. Ciao. Damn it! I wanted to hear him answer this question. Um, cool. We'll wrap this up quick then. Uh, Luke asks, are you guys big on the hobby side as someone who loves the game, but sucks at doing the hobby? I'd love some tips on how to improve. Obviously Noah loves the hobby. We've talked about that a lot, but, um, even, even outside the context of big picture, not loving the hobby, when you find yourself in a hobby drought or a rut, how do you get yourself out of that boys? Well, um, I'm in an interesting spot when it comes to questions like this. Um, on the one hand, I mean, you guys see me basically every show. I'm, I try to paint while we do this just because it kills two birds with one stone. I need to sneeze. I'm sorry. Or not. Um, yeah, I, I kind of have um, phases of interest in the hobby. So it's a little bit difficult difficult for me to answer this question. What I mean by phases of interest is like my my motivation to paint is very like, um, uh, oh, what's the word? Uh, it's like momentum based where like when I have a project I'm working on that I'm very excited about and not only am I enjoying the process, but I'm also excited about the, the, uh, the product. I think that's when I'm most uh, most productive, right? It's like all cylinders are firing. I'm enjoying seeing things come together. And then once it's finished, I'm like, yes, we made it there. So um, if you're struggling with that and you can't enjoy either the product or the process, my advice would be to try to find one of those things to fixate on. And I always prefer enjoying the process. Um, if you're just someone who 
you know, I want to paint because I need a three color model for the table, then yeah, I I don't really have an, any advice for you. I'm sorry. Like that's just never the person I've been. Um, if you're if you're struggling to find like some more concrete hobby uh, interests, you you gotta like dig scratch under the surface a little bit and think like, what is my motivation? Is it playing with a cool looking army? Is it from like you know giving my opponent a satisfying game, playing as an army that looks really nice instead of just dog shit? Um, is it uh, you know completing uh, you know a display board and seeing everything all thematically pulled together? Any of those can be a valid way to enjoy um, painting, and it's just like some one of those things, right? Like, it, it, if you if you're more results oriented person, think about it that way, or if you enjoy the process, come up with change change your routine a little bit in some way that helps you uh, enjoy that a little bit more. Um, so, like, you know, one thing that everyone and not everyone, but a lot of people in Portland kind of laugh at me for is like, I've never used an airbrush ever. I just enjoy brush painting. And that's because the process of like seeing things slowly, but surely come together, like right at my fingertips, instead of just sprayed out of some nozzle. Um, it's just so much more satisfying to me. So like that process is something that I really value. So um, change up your hobby game to to try something like that instead, if, you, if you've always used an airbrush or try a different technique or um, something like that. That was kind of a very scatterbrained answer. How do you guys feel about this? Yeah, I'm going to answer this question with a thing that, not that I think I do well, but that I think I do poorly and I'm trying to change. Um, for me, I get it, uh, the particular way it, 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 that my brain fixates on hobby is often uh, in, I want really big chunks. I really enjoy, oh, this weekend, this is painting weekend. And I'm going to spend eight hours or maybe 14 hours each day just painting. And like I want to get fully knee deep in it, um, and you know get my audiobooks going, get a, a ton of stuff done, have a bunch of stuff that looks really really great. Whether that's a ton of models, models all at once, or just a, some a couple models done to a, a standard that I'm really happy with, that's like how I like to do projects in everything, but especially in this. And I think that is the wrong approach. Um, Ryan Sherwick is actually or Sherwish, Sherwish. Anyway, sure Ryan, Ryan C. Sorry? Ch oh, sure. sure, witch. That's what it is. It's the witch. He, he gets mad at me when I say wick. He says it's wrong. Anyway, whatever. Our buddy Ryan um, said at one point that he paints for like an hour every single night. Like just an hour, not a big two, three hour, 90 minute, just like 45 to 60 minutes every single night. And that is how you get shit done. I agree. Um, I think that... Uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about hobbying and putting off hobbying until I can actually have this giant chunk of time to do it. And those chunks of times are really hard to come by. But an hour that I probably would have spent before going to bed, scrolling through TikTok, not that hard to come by if I can find the discipline to do it. And I think it's going to take a little while for it to become a habit, but that seems like how you get through backlogs, right? Because I am very good at painting my new exciting thing. And the couple things that don't get painted that fall through the cracks absolutely never get touched. And I have thousands of dollars of miniatures that are just like, I don't have any plans to paint them. I think Lucas does a really good job of avoiding this somehow. I, I You own like single digit number of unpainted models at any point in time, which is why. I've picked up a lot more recently, but my, my rule of thumb is always try your damnedest to paint what you have before you get more. And I know that's like super hard for a lot of people. And there's definitely times where I slip and start, you know, I have like 80 unpainted boys now or whatever, because I just happen to pick up a whole bunch. But like, if you, if you, after you make a purchase, okay, that was cool. I've built with them. I played some games with some unpainted models. Now it's hobby time. We're going to spend three or four, or two or three weeks completing this project. It's going to look great at the end. Like that kind of back and forth between getting new stuff, painting it, getting new stuff, painting it. It's some back and forth that keeps you engaged with the hobby. And when you're painting, right, like you say, spend an hour to an hour and a half, like kill two birds with one stone, right? If, if it's if it's too much to devote that time just to painting, do like do what um, Noah suggested, and, like watch a movie with other people while you're painting. Or like one that one of the things that we had we did last week that I thought was really fun and I want to do more of is like get three or four of your friends together on a Sunday and like spend an afternoon and evening painting. That way, four people can get a whole bunch of stuff done, and it's really fun. Um, you know, we social always, pressure we always... is powerful. Definitely. Saying, "Hey, I'm gonna paint. Come join me." 
it, I mean, we're in obviously a pretty unique situation where we like that can be come down the hall and not come drive over to my house and leave your kids alone. Um, but anytime and when and uh, you know, there there's that 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 social element to it that oh everyone's watching me. I don't want to be on my phone. I want to get shit done. Whereas if I'm alone in my room painting, like I can switch to my phone at any moment. Um, yeah, use what use what works for your brain. What do you think, Nick? How do you how do you how do you get make painting happen? Yeah, I'm kind of with you. Um, I definitely have a hard part with hobbying where I don't think I'm very good at it, so I have a really hard time getting motivated because I'm afraid to like mess this model up. Um, like I see so many amazing hobbyists around here, and so like I have like these cool ideas in my head, and then when I go to like put it on the paper, I'm like, uh, I don't I don't know what I'm doing, you know. Um, and I'm also certainly more motivated to paint when it's a model I want to play um like in a list so that's usually what gets me going is like okay i have a tournament in x week's time let's like paint a little bit i usually paint on the weekends i definitely have a hard time like usually uh, like on the weeknights um i know like painting an hour wouldn't i would be really good um but i just it, it's like i again find myself like making excuses because it's like oh i'm too tired to like paint right now you know i don't want to mess up that sort of thing um so it's hard a big issue too is space. We don't really have a lot of space to paint at my current place. Um, so I'm definitely looking forward to, uh, like something I really miss, like Lucas and I would paint um, a decent amount in our living room. Um, we had a nice big living room at our old place. Um, and so I remember us doing some paint nights and he definitely helped me motivate, motivate me to do that. Yeah, having someone around you to help is, is a huge deal. So, yeah, I, I think I'm big on the hobby side. Like, I think it's a super cool part of the game, and it's a part I'd love to be better at. Um, it's just, like, when I find myself having limited time to interact with 40K, I usually spend that time, like, let's play the game because I want to, like, get better and, <laughs> you know, practice these matchups. Um, so, yeah, it's certainly one of those, like, once I decide to get into hobbying more, when, I don't know when I'll do that, I, I want to, like really dive deep and like f kind of master it. That's kind of how I like get into things. I mean, I'm sure that's, we all understand like obsession with a hobby, right? Like when, when you get into something, you want to like fully grasp it and try to master it. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's how I, I feel about it. Unfortunately, I don't really have huge tips on how to improve. Um, <laughs> we lost our, our one guy here. <laughs> it's probably the best obvious. Um, Lucas certainly has like the best tips among, uh, among us. Um, but I think it's one of those like go slowly but surely and don't don't feel bad about trying to make something perfect and start simple. Like you might have a crazy idea in your head, but it's going to be really hard to put like that to paintbrush. Um, I think some of my models that I'm like most proud of is I had this like three week stint where I was getting some like my Votan ready for um, a tournament. And I just went real simple with those. And I had a ton of fun doing those for that th those three weeks. Uh, I didn't try anything super crazy. So yeah yeah uh, the the whole the whole yeah. thing that you I've, I've heard you say before and i, I sort of kind of heard here was that like you, you might not be like as as versed in the hobby as some of us but like well that might not be true from a time perspective i think you do absolutely have the skills to succeed and i think anyone has the skill to succeed it just requires um a that you see some like cool results from yourself and like that kind of like bulks up your belief and like i can do this and i think from for you for an example like that uthar was a great example of this like that dude was like, holy shit, this could, this is, this looks so cool. And I cannot wait for a time when, you know, the rest of Nick's Votan army looks, yeah, it's, it's serviceable. Like it looks good. It, it does the thing. But like when it all looks as cool as Uthar, like that's going to be a cool day. And I'm very excited for that. So yeah. um, you, you got to find something like that. Some kind of, you know, you got to enjoy the process or the result. And that is, that is the thing. Like you're, you're spending a lot of free time on this, on the hobby. You have to enjoy it. If you're forcing yourself to do it, you're never going to succeed. Like, I'm just, I'm sorry. That's kind of how it works. You need to find some kind of like external fact that, that brings you joy from the process or the result. I, I would push back against that last point just a little bit. I think that it, there is some element of activation energy here where you, I find that I need to force myself of, of, to do something like this a couple times and then I will remember how much I enjoy it, but it's going to feel like, like pulling teeth until you pull the teeth. Um, that's fair. Like, I can, 
the I think the big thing is like you want to minimize the amount of time you spend not doing the thing and doing everything else except it. Like if you can spend a lot of time like, oh man, here's this cool, crazy army that I've dreamt up. It's gonna be really awesome to do all this cool stuff. And then I never get around because I have such this crazy idea up here and so little in front of me, like go make the thing. It doesn't matter if it sucks. It is so much cooler if it's made than if you're talking about it. Um and you you're not you you're not going to get better by not doing the thing. The only way you're going to get better is by doing it. And maybe your first five or ten models in that army need to get redone at the end of it. Fine. You like you will find things that you like by doing them, um, not uh, just by by hoping to some um, day be ready for it. If your pile of shame right. is daunting, that, mm -hmm. that, sorry, one more tiny little thing. If That's a great of, point. If mm -hmm. your pile of shame is daunting, slim it down. Like either sell models or get rid of them by some by some amount. But but if if, if you're looking at your three hundred models and you can't bring yourself to paint one, reduce your three hundred to like fifty or a hundred, and then that'll look much more manageable. And then also when you complete yeah. a project, it won't be one thirtieth of your pile of shame; it'll be <laughs> half of it, and then you'll actually be able to get somewhere. Yeah, that's a great point. Um. If you're interested in joining a community to help you uh, on this journey, check out the, uh, what do we call it? The Painting Miniature Golf in Stat Check? Yeah, it's a cool channel. I don't I don't participate in that. Yeah, it's fun. yeah I've, I've been meaning to, to get involved in that. It's a really cool thing. Check that out in our uh, in our Patreon Discord. Um, all right, sweet. Let me back up some GSC questions real quick. Um, this one's, actually, I think you guys might have, I might need some of y'all's help on this one. Um, for all but really Tyler is the GSC player. How do you draw the line between doing something cute that's actually good and just doing cute shit that screws you later, especially when you're playing a tricksy or positional army like GSC? Lucas is looking at me like I'm the worst qualified person to answer this question. Bang, well, not only that, but also like bang out a question easily. I could talk about this for like half an hour. Um, but just like yeah. focus on the most important part of the game, right? Like points matter. So think about how what you're doing, and if it's like if it's a multi-step problem to like block one enemy unit, or you know, die, deny three points if they draw engage, or you know, set up for investigate signals at the expense of the rest of your entire game plan, then don't do it. Think about it, especially in unfavored situations. Think about like the core of what you need to do to win and execute that. Yeah. I've talked about this in the past, and this is the thing that I'm working on, but that I think is really powerful, is that cute shit is cute and not good when you're thinking about it from a bottom-up perspective instead of from a top-down perspective. And what I mean by that is, if you approach the turn and say, okay, what do I need to do? I need to kill these two things because they're going to run ramshot through me if I don't. I need to prevent this thing from getting over here, and I need to minimize how many points my opponent is scoring. Cool. If in trying to solve those problems, you say, ooh, what if I go for this play over here and block out the reserves and they have to come in over there instead? That keeps them from getting over here and makes that no longer a threat. I can reallocate the resource over there to killing them. That's a good play. What's a bad play, usually the way that they come about to me, is I look around the table and I'm like, all right, what are we doing this turn? Ooh, I could do a crazy thing. That'd be really cool. And like I see the play before I have a reason, you know, it's a solution looking for a problem. That's when it's too cute, right? Build up the fundamentals of what you need to do with your turn before yeah. you think about like crazy individual things that you want to do. If you need yeah. to kill these two things, do that. Oh, I can also steal the primary while doing that because I have a three inch deep strike. Okay, do that. Oh, I can also prevent them from moving through this gap with the same unit. Okay, do that. But like if you miss the kill the two units part at the beginning, then you're fucked next turn because those two units are alive. Yeah. Do you have any further thoughts on this, Nick? Uh, I agree. Um, I think outside of the game, if you're like thinking about putting a unit in your list too, and you're like, oh, this unit seems kind of goofy, I usually just run up on my friends first, and if they tell me stop it, then I don't play it, you know? If they're like, that unit is too silly for the amount of points you're spending on it, or like, what's its role in your list? Um, so that's like kind of applying that same concept to list building. Like, is this thing too cute? You know, does it actually serve yeah. its purpose for the amount of uh, like investment I'm putting into it? Absolutely. All right. Uh, other GSC question. Listening to you guys while I'm holding my newborn. So thank, thanks for keeping this old dad entertained. Well, first of all, I think this is Gabe. Yeah, Gabe, absolutely. Congratulations on the birth of your child. Uh, I'm sure you've seen in the Discord, but I've been playing around with Guard Indirect in my GSC. Have you been messing around with any other Broodbrother comps other than Kadich and Chimera Tarox builds? 
Uh, I'm not playing GSC right now. <laughs> They're really bad. Um, so I haven't been messing around with them personally. I did just get my um my uh, Cyclops, which I love. They're so cute. <laughs> anyway, um, so like I, but yeah, I'm not that excited about GSC with or without guard, and particularly with guard taking up a place in the eight. It's really hard to argue for GSC with guard as a as a good solution to the GSC problem. Uh, we have a codex coming out in like six months, I think five months. I don't know. We're a late summer some, book, some I think. amount of redacted months. Yeah, a redacted number of months. Six to eight business months, I think. Um, so whatever the case, hold out hope. Um, if you really want to play them right now and you want to use and you're going to use guard, the basilisks. I don't personally see it um, because usually. Indirect fire is really good at forcing your opponent out, and GSC don't really want their opponent to come out. Like, most of my games that go well are when my opponent stays too far back, and I'm able to pick at the corners, there's too much, and then they fall apart, and then you bring down the hammer, right? Flushing them out into the open, I get that you have a lot of guns that you'd like to shoot at them, but the right call was probably for them to be out in the open anyway. So I'm not sure that it solves the fundamental problems with the book because it doesn't help you with getting rushed. The Katachin, Chim Katachin Chimeras or Katachin Taroks, they help with you getting rushed. They set up screens, they set up move blocks, they deny primary without trading damage units in the process. Like, that's the fundamental reason that I haven't gone too deep into the indirect path. It's also really expensive. Um, but... Uh, they're good units at the end of the day. So if you can make a thing that works, that's awesome and more power to you. Um, I just don't think that it fundamentally solves a problem that GSC had um, other than like infiltrators that don't have the loan op librarian. I guess. But like I'm not... Nah, that's not the kind of space marines that I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about redeemers and durable stuff like... I don't, I don't see it personally, but maybe it may, may, may like that. I don't think that it's fundamentally bad. I just don't think that it solves the problem that I am trying to solve. I think y'all have comments on that. You're welcome to make them while I double check if we missed anything. No, I haven't seen GSC in forever, so I don't, I don't really know. Also, half the yeah. reason that guard artillery is good is because of overlapping fields and fire and plus one to hit and scout sentinels. So if you're not yeah. taking all three of those, only one of which you even have access to. Like AP2. For the record, Gabe does take a scout sentinel. He does he does take a scout sentinel. I've seen I've seen his lists. Step in the right direction. But yeah. But like yeah, having AP2 indirect instead of AP4. You also don't have um the like order for plus one to hit, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's what makes guard yeah, good. Good. Uh, He had another part of his question, right? Okay. Mm, I see it in the Discord. Oh, about oh, was that this was for Noah? But we can ask this to Lucas yes, instead because he also Lucas, plays Chaos Knights. Our resident hog yeah. cranker, dude. YouTube rejected the comment. I think it's it oh, because it includes a gun. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. He says, all right, Lucas, gun to your head. If you took double Lancer Chaos Knights to an RTT, what would be your dog choice to go with that? Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, this is why y'all pay the big bucks to come yell at us in, us in the Discord, so that you can make Lucas this uncomfortable. My first reaction would be, okay, you're spending a bunch of points on Lancers. Let's just keep it cheap to fit as much other stuff in as possible. And actually try to overload, especially because, like, yeah, the Lancer might be hard to move around, but it is still tanky. Like, that is the reason you take it. So if you're taking two of them, take as much other stuff to kind of play into that as possible and just try to overload your opponent. I would take, like, four or five carnivores, maybe, like, one or two dogs that kind of hold the backfield and provide some support, maybe mow down some screens. And then from there, you just take a bunch of demon allies. I think the more big knights you have, the more of your army proportionally should be demons so that you can actually still play tactical when you're removing dogs. So I'd recommend beasts. Um, unfortunately, all the Zeech units are basically out because you have to take Zeech battle line. The cheapest Zeech battle line is like 150 point, 15 points or whatever blue horrors are. So they're pretty bad. But um, Nurgle has a lot oh, of good they're the best unit in demons. What are you talking about? Battle line and otherwise. Um, they're just like kind of tough and cheap for the points. 
So uh, yeah, I'd recommend beasts. I'd recommend nurglings. There's even some nurgle characters that I think are worth exploring, like the uh, the boppity style, style, whatever the fuck that guy is. The battle shot guy. Piper? Yeah, that one. Like I said, um, <laughs> he's pretty funny. So yeah, I just take as much other stuff as possible. So carnivores and nurgle demons. Makes sense. You heard it right here. Double lancer, six carnivores. That's the list. It's the best list demons. in the game. That's that's you can say it that is. verbatim. Yep, you heard it right here from USA player Lucas Troller. Uh, you heard it from Stat Check. That's even better. Throw throw innocent Anthony under the bus while you're at it. Um, anyway, cool. Well, uh, we didn't do mid show plugs, so we'll do end show plugs. And I was told to get better at these, and then I didn't practice them. So I'm sorry. Uh, but if you like what you're listening to here, make sure to interact on whatever platform you're listening to it on. YouTube is the most important one. Uh, subscriptions, likes, comments there go a long way. We do record the show roughly every Saturday at 10 a.m. Our next show is going to be uh, the 16th of March on YouTube here at youtube.com slash stat check. Uh, you should be able to see the event up well in advance of that because we know what it is. We're going to talk about our runs at Cascade, um, how we all went to and four. Bummer. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, that'll be really funny if that happens and we'll all be really sad. Uh, but yes, check that out. Um, if you want to keep the conversation going between now and two weeks from now, you can check us out over on discord. Like I said, head over to patreon.com slash stat dash check, uh, in order to sign up for that. It's only five bucks a month and it is the most dynamic, uh, discord server in the world, uh, for 40 K I would say. Um, I think we're at what, like 500 and something people or some nonsense. It's great. There's people talking about whatever it is you want to talk about in Warhammer, and you have ready access to all of the hosts of all of the programs. You can add us at any point in time. You should add Lucas in the middle of the night. It's very funny. Um, he'll probably be asleep. Um, probably. But yeah, uh, we've got several overall supporters of the, sh of the show that we'd love for you to check out as well, such as Waylon Yutani, who make uh, the official terrain for the World Team Championship. Check their stuff out. There's a discount code. Description. I hope. Um, also check out Red Dragon Games if you're anywhere near northeastern Canada and in need of some miniatures. They've got a great used supply in addition to a whole bunch of new supply. They somehow seem to have everything in stock. I don't know how they do it, but Dan is incredible. Um, his name is Dan, right? Pretty sure. Man, I'm bad at this. Uh, but yeah, check that out. Uh, we sell widgets. They're on, on Etsy. Uh, they're great. I have some of them. I've lost some of them, sadly, but I have some. They're wonderful. Uh, we've got a whole bunch more stuff coming out soon. I know there's been discussion of uh, of some more uh, dice and objective markers and whatnot. Um, so look forward to that as it comes through. But with that all being said and done, thanks so much for listening for this two and a half hour nonsense. Uh, I've been Tyler. I've been Nick. How the hell did we talk for two and a half hours? <laughs> He's still Lucas. Um, <laughs> and we'll see. <laughs> and we'll um, we'll see. Talk about Cascade. Uh, it's going to be nicely produced. We'll have slides. It's going to be very sexy. Right here first. Dance, dog.